Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. Yeah, I'm, open, I'm, on, I'm skating on the thinnest <laughs> ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out, and I'm, I know it's a black moon. I'm, yeah. like, I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. This week's guest, I've brought him back in. It's only the boss. Kev, how are you, mate? Bewildered. Wondering how the hell you got me back in here. How many was it? Six or whatever podcasts to get you out of the shit we cut of it. I said never again, didn't I? We never never finished that series, actually, did we? To be continued, mate. Um, I've got friends in high places in Nash and that's how I've managed to get you back in here. But... You're looking sun-kissed, healthy, and you've been living the dream, haven't you, mate? Yeah, I've had basically um, summer abroad. Yeah, yeah, so you know, I had enough of this imprisonment. Yeah, so, yeah, the moment I got on, the, the day they um, uh, announced you could fly to Portugal, you know, I was off. You know, in fact, you might have seen me on the news. <laughs> we we, we uh, got to uh, Gatwick and... Uh, Walked out to the plane, and there was about 10 TV crews on the runway. I got interviewed by BBC ITV and another one. He my, loves it, mate, never mates, shot. Mates were texting me, Oh, I've just seen you on the news tonight, but yeah, yeah. And then, so, um, yeah, it was, it was an amazing holiday, just you know, feeling of freedom. Well, I said this before, I haven't been on here, have I? But yeah, just a great feeling of freedom. So, yeah, yeah and, and you said to me, which is testament to a brilliant holiday, um, you don't remember half of it, mate, so that must be a good one. <laughs> I haven't drunk since I got back, which for me, <laughs> I, I said to Alan, you know, I said, um, I could have murdered somebody. I'd go to my grave believing I was innocent. You know. uh, I actually had a session in the pub and I cannot remember even going to the pub. Apparently I was talking to a mate who gave me a lift home. I can't remember a thing. <laughs> Time to give up, I think. But, <laughs> well, I don't know. And, you, uh, and you're back out soon, aren't you? You're heading back out soon. Is that right? Yeah, I'm going to go out um, again in early November. It'll still be. Whew. If if you get the weather right, it'd still be twenty degrees in the day. You know, so, oh, yeah, yeah. Too right, mate. You've worked hard. You deserve it, mate. It sounds it sounds very nice. You're making the most of it. Now, yeah, what makes me die? The kids say, "Oh, going back on another guy again." No. Yeah, you cheeky kids. I've had forty odd years. You know, you know, you know, one time I worked fourteen, sixteen hours a day. Yeah, you know, you know, look at you accusingly. You, know, you shouldn't be having all this time off. Yeah. You know? Too much fun, mate. Life's for living. you got to do it, mate. You deserve it. Well, that's what I've got with you lot now, so I can start <laughs> enjoying life. Yeah. Yeah. Too right, mate. I'm not doubting it. I'm with you. Um, what I wanted to talk about is a lifelong sort of passion, if you like, of yours, but something that you've cultivated over your career in angling is fisheries. Now, we sit on a site currently where at the back there are two lakes, one of which is, well, now probably one of the best lakes in the country, full stop. Some incredible fish in there. But you've had a fishery in France. You've got Royston as well. You've got a massive CV of lakes built up over time. And I wanted to talk about how in amongst product innovation, in amongst your angling, you've then managed to get into fisheries. And if you like, as a starting point, Kev... How did you come to the decision in amongst everything else that was going on at the time to to go, right, well, I'm going to get involved in, in making my own fishery? I think it was because I um, recognised my f- cart fishing career was coming to an end. That might sound a bit shocking, but that is a fact. You know, um, around the mid-90s, I began to get somewhat disillusioned with the scene Cart fishing scene, um, it changed dramatically. Um, it was becoming very overcrowded on you know, on waters. You know, I 
as you know, I started at a time when you know, there was probably less than 500 carp anglers in the country, you know. And, you know our, our mission was to find a water that contained carp, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, now, well, by the, by the 90s, basically everywhere had carp, you know, and it was big. And uh, with fishing tackles coming in, fishing tackle, more and more fishing tackle companies starting up and more and more marketing going on and more and more information available. Um, a massive number of people came into the sport. Um, so it was difficult to find the sort of fishing that you know, I've been brought up on, um, pioneering fishing. You against the carp, it become more you against the other anglers, which I haven't got a problem with, but... What I have got a problem with is sitting at one end of the lake, knowing the carp are somewhere else, and I can't get on them because you've got all these time bandits, you know, who, you know, who've got weeks and weeks because they don't work. You have mm. to just sit there, you know. Whereas, you know, I've only ever had, other than the holidays, I've only ever had a maximum of really thirty-six hours, forty-eight hours a week to fish, you know, and I can't. By nature, just waste my time. You know, I have to be really on it and active, and so you know, I can't just sit there when I know you know, I, I can't catch a carp because they're up the other end, and you know the guys sitting on them are going to be there for another month. You know, so there was that. Plus, um, sad to say, the increased number of people uh, increased the competitiveness. And then there was rivalry because you weren't on the right bait. You know, everyone on the lake is say sponsored on X bait company. So if you stepped on that lake with a different bait, you're public enemy number one. As happened to me at the manor. You know, you know that story. You know, and I just wasn't enjoying it anymore. Basically, um, I'd done quite a lot of fishing in uh, Europe in the nineties, and. I loved that, but I didn't have the time, you know, to really apply to it. You know, I think what me and Nigel did at um, Lac de Dare was, you know, the, the nearest I could ever get to um, regularly fishing, but ridiculous. You know, we was driving the way down to Lac de Dare, as you know, for like two, three nights. You yeah. know? You know, um, so we made it like an English water, but, you know, that wasn't sustainable. But we'd done that anyway. But... Um, yeah, uh, you know, I've always said that carp anglers' career is a circle. You know, first you want to catch carp, then you want to catch more carp, then you want to catch the biggest, then you want to see how they work. You don't really want to catch them, just you know, fascinate you watching them. Uh, big shout to Lloyd, by the way. He's a podcast the other week. You know, great kid, you know, so I loved listening to him you know, and how he's, how he's watching and learning all the time, you know, I would suggest he's possibly at that stage now. You know, mm. And then if you're still, you know, if you're still uh, up for the ride, you know, then, then you want to help other people catch them. And then, um, you kind of take stock, it, take stock, you know, in my, in, in my case, it was, oh, let's, let's get a fishery. But I think most long-term anglers, um, they're just either give up or, Possibly fish abroad a couple of times a year with mates, you know, more of a holiday and a release and anything. Or they lower their objectives and just try and tuck themselves away on you know, some water. It's not about big fish anymore. It's about peace, you know, managing you know, peace and quiet and getting away from the crowds and um, just fishing how you want to fish. You know, and that, you know, I, it's not just my generation. You know. The generation after me, which would have included Rob Mayling. I think the only time Rob fishes now when he goes to Angler's Paradise with his boy. Mm. You know, you know, uh, I bump into you know, people I've known through the years all the time. You know, he's still fishing. Oh, no, I've been for a few years. Or, yeah, yeah, I've got a little water tucked away you know, in case you go down there. You know, it's, it's a natural progression. Um, a carp fishing career has only got so many years. You know, I've always said, you know, how many big fish do you want to catch? You know, um, I'm not saying it gets boring, but it does get a bit pointless, you know, just having, oh, I've caught that 50, well, where will I go with the next 50? You know, unless 
unless you have to. Mm. And the example is Terry Earn. You know, he's, he's, his pay from his sponsors um, depends on him going out and catching fish. And frankly, I want to be in his position. I know, does he really truly enjoy it nowadays? You know what? If someone had that honest conversation with him, I bet he, I bet he hasn't got half the buzz that he had, you know, when he's on the car park and all that lot with Nigel Dennis on Nashville, you know. Yeah, it's um it's just I would imagine it's just a grind for him now, you know. Mm. Yeah, so I was at that point. Um my the car fishing life that I'd known had changed dramatically. I got it back actually once when me and Anna uh, went on what we call the big pit. Yeah. You know, you know, um, what was that? Ten years ago now, roughly? Seven, eight years ago? And oh, that, you know, that really fired me up. You know, hundred odd acres, wild water. Um, the hard work of just managing to move around it and, you know, not knowing really what was in there. That that really was fantastic, you know. And I if I could still find waters like that, undoubtedly I'd still be doing it, but you know, they, they're just not around. They're just not around. We're so lucky to have found that one, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I still would like to do it, but um, you know, so the world's moved on, yeah. So so anyway, yeah, so um, I bought this farm primarily because um, I wanted to... Uh, to have the house and the mortgage and the factory all in one. Um, I went through a really tough recession in the early 90s, or well, the beginning of the 90s. It really was you know, a tough one. Um, it was a struggle to cover the overhead. Yeah. You know, and uh, I had an agent in Holland who, you know, his home was um, his warehouse. You know, and it kind of struck me as you know, not a bad idea. You know. If my house mortgage become you know, uh, the only mortgage I had, you know, and so the factory was free. So I looked around and luckily just fell on this place, you know, um, uh, which was really, um, well, it was originally um, uh, an orchard. Oh, was it? Yeah, and a couple bought it after the war. You know that Nissen hut, that army hut? Yeah. That's where they lived. Was it? Yeah, if you look in, if you walk in there, you notice there's a divide between uh, that two thirds of the way down. That was their bedroom in the back. <laughs> <laughs> tough, tough people in those days. Yeah, believe it or not, they're called Joseph and Mary. No, <laughs> yeah, honestly, honestly, a little baby called Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, they set up a, uh, an egg farm here. The front barn uh, was you know, where the chickens were. Um. The back one was just a hay barn falling in walls and everything when we bought it. But anyway, they was um, uh, producing eggs. Um, they then built their house next door. And, and then they built this house uh, for their manager. And anyway, eventually, they got, I think they got foul pest disease twice and decided to close down and retire. And they sold uh, this house... Uh, going down to the bottom and t uh, to the two fields, the one dead down the bottom, the one to the left, with this property. Uh, yeah, and I was lucky enough to, to see it for sale. And um, yeah, yeah, I got it. It was, it was funny actually. The first time I come round, I, I knocked on the door, and uh, the daughter come to the phone. Uh, the door, I guess she was about seventeen, eighteen. I said, "Could I have a look round?" And she said, "Oh, can you come back next week?" Sorry, two weeks' time because my, my parents are away on holiday in France, actually. Nice. Yeah. And it, I think she was uncomfortable about showing me around the house you know, on her own. I don't blame her. She was quite tasty. <laughs> <laughs> um, Classic. <laughs> so I said, Oh, do you mind if um, I look around um, the land of the bar? She said, No, help yourself. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I just fell in love with it. You know, it had enough room to, for our very small. Uh, business then, you know, mm. the machinist, you know, warehousing, you know, the, 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 you know, the front barn plus, you know, if I, if I uh, rebuilt the back one, uh, definitely was um, enough space there. And then I'm looking at land and I thought, oh, wow, I could actually put a lake on this, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I went back there twice more before the parents' home 
uh, come home. I then went in the estate agents and said, um, yeah, I want it. I then went home and told the missus I bought it. Oh. <laughs> How did that go down? And she hadn't even seen it. She hadn't <laughs> even seen it. Well, I suppose it was another another now towards uh, the divorce, wasn't it? That <laughs> eventually happened, but come to think of it, it wasn't the first time I'd done on that. We was um, in Cyprus once. I said, I'm just going down to the supermarket, get some beer, and I come back with a villa. Just remember <laughs> that. Just remember that. Yeah. Oh, no, she ain't. No. <laughs> I figured that was the last one. Yeah, remember, we never moved in. I bought it off the plans, and it was a month away from being finished, and we got divorced. Oh, <laughs> what could have been? Uh, dear. Yeah. But this has been Where a sound investment, Where hasn't it? it? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Massive investment. Yeah, so um, anyway, I digress. So, yeah, um, time to build a lake. Or lakes. Um, I had two in mind, just in case something went wrong. You know, um, mm. no, um, better to lose fish in one lake than two. That was my logic. And yeah, so um, it was originally one field sloping down, uh, and then you know there's a winter feed deep ditch at the bottom, as you know. And then, as I said, it was two fields sloping up. Um, in my ignorance, you know, original plan was, oh, we'll put a dam across the ditch. Um, so, you know, I was thinking one lake. But then um, I had a guy in to survey it, and you know, this is where I learned a lot. First thing I learned was uh, I might not, it might not be a viable site, for example. I knew it was mainly clay, um, but if you've got, excuse me, if you've got a gravel seam going through your land, then the water's just going to run out with it, you know. Um, so the only way to solve that problem, by the way, is then to line, line it, mm. you know. But that is a very expensive, you know, to bring muck in, just like it's very expensive to take muck out. You know, you always want to avoid that. That's why, by the way, you've got the two hills with the path walking down to the lakes. That was the uh, excess uh, from the dig. Yeah. Rather than take it off site. But yeah, anyway, so very nervous time when they surveyed the site to test um, if the clay was up to it. Um, they brought a digger in. If I remember, they dug down about six foot in a number of places, uh, took a sample of the clay. Um, it was then a very um, scientific test. The guy just balled it tight as he could in his hand and threw it on the floor. <laughs> Oh, that's good clay, boy. We can dig a lake here. No, <laughs> as simple as that, really. Um, I then actually got a geological survey and found out um, there's 200 metres of clay underneath here. Oh, yeah. So, so I yeah, never would, uh, needed to worry. Yeah. That's pretty deep. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty deep. Yeah, great if you want a bore hole. <laughs> um, yeah, and... Um, the next thing I learned was that actually it's much more viable to dig a lake on a slope than it is on a flat plain. Mm. Um, when I when we did the lakes, I don't know what it is now, but when we did the lakes, it was it worked out a thousand pound per acre per foot, right? So it's for so for example, if you dug an acre lake on a flat field, six foot deep, costs you six grand. Mm. If you do it on a slope, it probably costs you half that because you're digging at the back end of the slope and then just pushing it forward mm. to form your dam. See what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so it's far cheaper and that's how I come to the conclusion, well, okay, then we use the whole backfields for lakes and I'll have two just in case something goes wrong with one of them. Uh, the back one, as you know, the largest uh, 4.7 acres is the church and then the one um, nearest, uh, 1.7 acres was... Um, the cops. So, contracted a company to do the dig. Um, that was interesting. Um, basically, they had three bulldozers. Um, the first one cut a trench um, across the field uh, that was going to be the dam wall. Mm. And what they do is they cut a trench... I think it was about four or five foot down. It was a width for a bulldozer. And they do that to cut for any land drains. Uh-huh. You know, the last thing you want yeah. is to have a land drain <laughs> so the water drains out. So they do that to cut for any land drains as well as, of course, have a, um, a 
good base for uh, what in essence is going to be a dam wall. Okay, and so they did that. The other two bulldozers had those, you ever seen those really big trailers where they bulldozers tow a trailer and it's got a knife on the bottom so as they're towing it, it scoops, scrapes the, uh, mm. you know, the clay, mud or whatever into it. And that's effectively how it's dug by scraping these uh, these traders scraping um, up the clay uh, to get it to the depth we needed, and you could have put it to music. So the, the bulldozers um, dug uh, the trench for the dam wall. Um, then these other two bulldozers start you know, making an impression. So basically, you know, it then ends up where you know, they really dug into uh, the, the ground and you know, they're going into a, a, a basin coming out full of clay. They then go around and drop it in the trench that was the uh, dam. Yeah. And then they both you know, go in a line. And the third bulldozer had now got a huge roller on the back with, I guess, um, they had spikes, say, six inches long. I think I was told that each spike could apply a pressure of two tonne or something. And that would then roll in the clay following them in so, uh, so you know so you could have put it to music these three bulldozers going in the you know, how and then round you know just following each other compacting the clay uh, yeah, and it made the damn wall um talking about six weeks i think was it six weeks mm, wow yeah, yeah it weren't long um i'll never forget you know because i was still at the factory at Rayleigh, and um i come home and uh, one of them's a fisherman <laughs> and I'd already said to him, I'll make sure like, you know, he'd get me some you know, nice little feature, features and that. And I'd come home and they're already pleased with themselves. They'd finished it. And I went and looked. You know, this is a church I'm talking about. And I kid you not, you could have played snooker on the bottom. It was that smooth. Was it? Yeah. And I think that is the skill of these guys. You yeah. know, to say, uh, you know, they've done a great job. If it's really <laughs> smooth and uniform. Yeah, Great. You know, so <laughs> I grabbed the fisherman one and I made him stay with me for another two, three hours that evening. And, you know, we dug out all, you know, tricky little uh, features and all that, you know, to make it, you know, an interesting fishery. Yeah. Yeah, so that was that. How I'd, how I'd, planned were those lakes? Because obviously, if you look at the format of both of them now, and I'm only going through recent times, because we're in the 90s, are we, when we're digging this? What end year? of the 90s. End of the 90s. So I wasn't there at the time, but if you... The format of them both is there's there's a central set of islands on both lakes, uh, and then obviously depths and, and and various other things sort of vary. But obviously clay is the the sort of what you're looking for if you're fishing for them now. With the weed growth, is those hard, those nice fresh fed on clay spots. The actual format of those lakes, did you have first of all an idea of them to both have islands in and why, and then also what what were they going to be? Were they just going to be your lakes, or were they going to be open to the public? Were they going to be syndicate? What What was the whole plan? Or did you not have one at this early stage? Right. First question first, uh, um, the design. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I did the design. I decided I wanted islands uh, so you didn't have to, uh, so you break up the view of someone sitting opposite. Um, a bit misplaced on that one, um, I think. You note know, the new lake hasn't got an island. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think with me, the jury's out with islands. Where, where all this is going is bloody swans. <laughs> <laughs> that has got to be one of the most useless birds on the planet. No wonder the Queen got them all. Jesus. And I have to say. Um, they're horrible, nasty things. You know, um, they really are aggressive bastards, you know, to anything <laughs> on a lake. Um, you know, we once had a swan on there that it decided it owned the lake and no other waterfowl were allowed on it. It was a nasty bastard. Mm. Um, I remember um, at a mallard, she um, actually hatched 11 um, ducklings in our, in our garden, in the hedgerow. And then she went on the office lake and then she took them down the bottom. And I followed her down because I was worried, you know, you yeah. know, you know foxes evening, daytime crows. You know, it's interesting when you get your own waters and you know, watching that. It's amazing how many uh, uh, chicks and duck, moorhen chicks and ducklings are carrying crows take, you know. Oh, yeah. 
you know, I never noticed it until I got this. But anyway, so I followed her down, and this bloody swan is right over the other side. He flew over, he smashed into her and the chicks. Uh, and over the next hour, he killed all the chicks. Mm. He cornered her in a reed bed and eventually grabbed her around the neck and shook her like a, a, a Jack Russell with a rat and broke her neck. Jeez. Savage. Yeah. Would I have islands now again? Well, I didn't next door. We haven't next door. But no. They are, they are a great feature, aren't they? They are a great feature. But anyone considering... Um, fishery planning and digging the fishery just know if you have an island you will have swans if you have swans then swans have signets swans oh. have signets swans and signets sit on the blank shitting everywhere and preening their feathers everywhere ends up like you know, pig sty just slimy wet stinking ground covered in white feathers or oh, they become black they're not they're not ideal they're not ideal but you can get around it just fence the islands with chicken wire Interesting mm. enough, swans walk onto islands, and so if you fence it, that's done them. Whereas geese will fly, fly over, on, and yeah. ducks, you know, and I've got no problem with the geese. No problem with the geese. Weird thing, and actually it was Tim Posey that noticed it. You know, he'd come down uh, some years back and had a, pair, had a swan on, battling all day long with uh, the several, I think we had a grey lag and two Canada geese, Families on there as well. And this fluing thing was battling all day long. Of course, the other thing is they're battling with the other birds and they're taking your lines out. Yeah. You know? Anyway, um, he noticed that the swan would sit on the bank next to the geese. And they, you know, wouldn't have They'd be any, fine. They'd be fine. And it's, it's so right. You know, if you watch them, you know, they battle with uh, geese or whatever all, you know, all the time on the water. But out, off the water, no. They can sit right next to each other as if they're mates. <laughs> Work that one out. Work that one out. Anyway, yeah, so um, I did have a plan in mind for how I wanted the lakes. Um, uh, one thing I will say, again, anyone thinking of digging a lake, is that the people digging it or, sur- or doing the survey for the site will never maximise the potential. They always make the lake too small. And they tell you, oh, no, you can't have any bigger because of, you know, but you always can. And that's what happened with mine. Um, we extended them later. Yeah, it's a bit of land there. Why isn't that water, you know? Um, yeah. But, yeah, um, anyway, so they, yeah, we, I basically designed them. Um, what was the second question? Why? Yeah, what What was the, what um, were you going to make them? Just yours or were you going to open them up? Or what was the plan at that stage? It was a kind of, it was several reasons. One, um, Echo was very vol- uh, vocal at this time. This is the um, English Carp Heritage Organisation, is that right? The English Carp Heritage Organisation, I think it is. I've learned something today, I didn't know that's what it was called. I think it is. I thought it was called, um, this is my chance for, to promote my ego. Um <laughs> And you know, he certainly did that for a couple of people who the hell heard of them uh, pre that. Um, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, less politics. Uh, yeah, and there's no way I was ever going to join it because I knew it wasn't going to last anyway. But um, the, all the shouting was about um, protecting English carp stocks, you know, apart from you know, um, um, slagging people off that weren't fishing for, you know, age-old you know, English carp, but it was about protecting English carp stocks. You know, there, was a, there was, Let's be honest, there was a number of illegal imports going on at the time. Mm. And I kind of was um, quite concerned about that. Um, a, about people you know, spiriting carp in transit vans from France into this country and you know, the dangers of spreading disease, but also I, I thought, you know, who the hell has got, you know, should be allowed to, you know, in essence, take people's carp from you know, another country to another fishery and then bring them over here? You know, um, I thought it was outrageous. That, by the way, bit me in the arse. And that's another story, which we'll probably come to later. Re Kavanagh. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to, in essence, uh, 
experiment to prove that you didn't have to import or steal fish from you know, Europe. You know, we could we could you know, easily hold our own and, you know, and have loads of uh, big carp in England. You know, my belief at the time and still is that uh, the natural weight of a carp in this country is mid thirties, maybe a bit more. Um, yes, we've had you get the odd freak set of circumstances like red mar, mm. very rich water, nothing in it, and um, selected fish being put in it. But if you look at history, um, basically that's the biggest they get. It's only the introduction of boilies that um, you know, wax their weight up. So. I knew it wasn't climate. You know, I'd fished a lot in France, Belgium, wherever. You know, and the climate was no different than here. What it was definitely down to was abundance and size of food offerings uh, and low biomass. You know, um, you know, crayfish, huge swamp mussel beds, whatever over there. You know, so they got the opportunity to crop much bigger food items mm. and. As I say, uh, the waters generally have a much lower biomass of carp. So I thought if I could replicate that in this country. Um, so now getting to your question. First Lake Church, um, that was going to be my test uh, experiment to see how big I could healthily get the carp. And so um, it wasn't going to be opened as a fishery. The second one, the cops... Um, I decided to open that as a fishery, a small syndicate, which it had originally. So, yeah, that was, that was really the plan. Mm. Names? Church and Cops? Where do they come from? Church, because there's a church just behind it. Nice. And the Cops, because there's a Cops next to it. Ah, I like that. All easy. clever stuff. Well, easy, right yeah. up there. Yeah. So from that point, the excavations happened filled how long did that take in terms of actually getting them filled and holding water somewhere there is a pitch i think anna might have had it have i think it. i've got i've got the picture i'll overlay yeah. it pretty right. soon i know the one it's, it's me sitting on the bank of the church with my head in my hands watching two northern friends who i'd met at warmwell and become really good friends quad biking through the bottom of the church <laughs> you know, you know like racing track and this was uh, the second summer. It never occurred to me it wouldn't rain. Mm. It never occurred to me. You know, we were relying on that winter feed ditch to... Um, we dug out the winter feed ditch, as you know, as kind of a sump hole to the right. Yeah, yeah. And that was to collect enough water as it went down uh, to then pump into the cops. And when the cops was filled, we was going to pump into the church. And it didn't <laughs> rain. <laughs> It didn't rain. You should have come up north, Kev. Oh, the whole winter, you know, where hardly any rain, the ditch hardly rain. It just never occurred to me. And I'm sitting there thinking, what have I done? You know, I've made a quad bike track instead of a fucking car. Like, I was an happy bunny. I was an happy bunny. The funny thing is that that next winter, um, it, it did rain. <laughs> and uh, we'd when we dug the sump out, um, we fitted a a pipe which had um, uh, an upright access. So it was like L-shaped, yeah? Yeah. So we fitted that because, uh, you know, next to the sun pole, as you know, is uh, the track. So, yeah, yeah. So we, we piped through the track and had this, you know, so it was just sticking out of the water. And all the rain's coming, uh, water's rushing down the ditch and my only focus in life is to capture as much water, water. as possible. <laughs> yeah, so I was, I was getting up at... Um, the pump I had was ridiculous, you know, little, um, uh, two little pumps I bought in screw fix, you know, petrol, you know, and so yeah. I had two of them running. And um, I was obsessed, you know, they, I think they run for about two, three hours. I was setting my alarm throughout the night to truck right. all the way down, you know, to fill in with petrol. Anyway, I was getting so distraught about, you know, I'm not keeping up with it. So I put a paving slab on top of this, um, you know, this pipe. I've gone down the next walk morning. The water's three foot over the <laughs> over the track. You know, the pumps are gone. All me, everything had gone washed down. It's now somewhere in the North Sea. But next door, um, I'd flooded like halfway up his oh, garden no. where it had backed up. You know, but yeah, um, we then 
I was I then was offered a fire engine pump. Right. Um it was it was every fire tender has got this mobile pump in them. Yeah, you know, four firemen, you know, can lift them and they put them, you know. Uh, this is an old fashioned one. And it was um a Cortina engine uh connected to this pump. Um, no exhaust or mm. anything. And we put that between uh, the cops and the church. So as the cops was filling up or filled up, I then pumped it into the church. And it was an incredible thing. You know, you'd fire it up, the engine would start going. And then there's this lever which you pull to create the vacuum to suck the water. And the scream it made was unbelievable. You could hear it in Holbridge, which is, free, what, what do you reckon? Three <laughs> yeah, mile away, yeah, two yeah, mile away? It's it unbelievable. You know, but, but yeah, so we had some adventures filling it up, but yeah. Eventually, eventually got them filled up that second winter. The second winter they were mm. full. In mm. terms of the the then the process of, of sort of ecology, creating an environment, etc., and the fish, how did that go about? Because I don't know how much of a background you had personally in sort of in in creating an environment that would be fertile, that would that would house and create big carp that you wanted to prove. And how that would lead into you actually just basically having your own lakes and doing it. How did that all work? In terms of background, if you mean learning, I, yeah. I, 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 I've had no education. Yeah, no fishery management. No fishery management stuff. or whatever. Um, but what I have always had is a massive interest in nature, uh, learning, and the capacity to listen to anyone who can teach me something. Mm. Yeah, um, surprisingly, a lot of people you know, haven't got that. They never listen. Dixie, I hope you're not listen, listening to this. <laughs> Wait, let's not put another chalk on a divorce board uh, there. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I will suck anyone's brain. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, I, I had, of course, vi- you know, fishing lakes all my life. And, you know, I got to know a lot of lake owners and all that. And I've always said, if you, know, if you want to learn about uh, fishery management or a fishery just talk to the people who lived it mm. know, and killed fish yeah because because <laughs> I say um, that is all part of the process you know I killed quite a few carp um, mm. along the way so yeah it was just um, through my observations like I said to you um, I observed that in my opinion we could get get carp into the fifties, you know, in in numbers rather than just like one in the country or whatever. Yeah, know, just by um, just by observing um, how they did it or how how it had become in Europe. You know, as I said to you, biomass um, equals rich rich um, food. So there was that. Um, I I really believe that. I couldn't do it just with bait or I couldn't have healthy fish with bait. So I wanted to create really naturally rich waters. So part of my plan was um, I wouldn't stock them with fish for three years. I'd just spend three years building up um, the natural food sources. And, yeah, we did that by... uh, Whenever I was fishing a lake, I spent more time, you know, wading around in it, you know, um, trying to <laughs> trying to catch snails and, you know, whatever. Then I did, um, you know, I did fishing for carp. You yeah. know, well, I'll rephrase that. I'm fishing for carp. I had rods out, but I was more interested in catching snails, you know, and stuff. Then, um, then I did carp. In fact, that's how we got the famous um, frog population. Um, oh God! Yeah, the frogs. Uh, the frogs. Yeah. Um, I was on Collingbrook. And, uh, you know, I was wading around netting uh, um, whatever I could, um, caddis and all that. Mm. We used to have great mayfly hatches down there, by the way, but that died out after a couple of years. Um, you know, it just shows that, you know, the water's got to suit the various animals. Mm. But anyway, you know, I netted this tadpole. And what the hell? You know, the thing was... Getting off four inches long. Jeez. And it had a, an 18 mil body. And um, <laughs> that is the frogs that used to be around Corningbrook. I could, I wrote this in Cartwell, by the way, and then uh, 
had a letter saying, do you know it is illegal to yeah. uh, uh, to transport um, non-native species? So I, I've dreamed what I'm saying now. You know, it didn't yeah. actually happen. But, yeah, so um, I'm kind of thinking, well, English English frogs and toads, they spawn March, yeah, and their tadpoles are quarter the size of these things, yeah, which spawn later. So I've got two bites of the cherry here and you had a massive bonus in the size of this food source. So, so yeah, um, got Gary on the job as well. And I think we brought back four frogs and about six tadpoles and hence the population we have now. They are, they are big old frogs, aren't they? The frogs aren't much bigger, I don't think. Oh, I think they're bigger, mate. I oh, do. You? I don't think they're much bigger they're than They're louder. English frogs. Certainly louder. Well, you know, Jeez. Well, the English frog, you know, it's only at the water till March. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. When you think about it, that must be where the uh, fairy story frogs come from. You know, the frogs sitting on the lily leaves. Yeah. Because the English frogs, they spawn and then disappear into the growth. Yeah, but, gone. but whereas these things, you know, they stay by the water all through the warm months, didn't they? Mm. Yeah, so um, I was doing what I could to um, bring all the various snails and that in, brought mussels in. That didn't work, though. Mussels don't like clay. Um, but, yeah, um, we've got a huge population of you know, snails, um, frogs and everything. Um, next thing was the planting. Mm. Um, we're talking uh, uh, trees, shrubs, yeah. but... Uh, you know, specifically at this time, well, in, in the beginning, I'm talking about the uh, the margins and uh, the lakes themselves. Um, I put in a massive amount of crisping, you know, little bundles with lead around it, yeah. dotted that all around. And then um, I started uh, planting marginals. Um, I never get contacted this uh, company in Norfolk that supplied pond plants got talking to a guy called Jeremy Driscoll on the phone um, he recommended some various you know, marginals and um, done a deal for 600 quid I think it was and they arrived and oh, yeah, lovely healthy looking plants my chagrin is they probably were like twice the size of this coffee table <laughs> Anyway, he's rang me up a bit later. How do you, what do you think of plants? I said, well, yeah, they're lovely, Jez. I said, but, like, you know. <laughs> I just worked out it's probably going to cost me 50 grand, yeah. you know, to plant me lakes, you know. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, how little I got for the money. And he went, right. He said, um, we supply all the garden centres, FOC. They have to, in essence, they had to... Um, manage the plants that they put into garden centres. And if the garden centres hadn't managed them well, you know, they were knackered, you know, tried yeah. that work. they would swap the stock, take the others back and to just chuck them in the yard. No. And if, you know, if some of them come round, then they might, you know, consider them. But in essence, they'd scrapped them. Right? Yeah. He then tells me he's a carp angler. Never oh. told me that before. Result. So so he'd done a deal, scope it squid for marginals. The universal currency of Scopit Squid. The universal squid. currency of Scopit Squid. Yeah, and so that's how um, um, basically the lakes were planted. I, I think I lost count at 50,000 pond plants Jesus. that I put in there. Yeah, it, was, it was quite hard work, actually. From there, the fish. I mean, even the time I've been here and been fortunate enough to fish it and seen people catch somebody... You said earlier on, uh, yesterday or today, I've caught their PB on there. But the fish in there are incredible in church at the moment. But the fish generally for both the cops and church, where, what were your selection processes? What sources? How did you go about sort of accruing stock to reach proportions that we're seeing now and historically back then? My first mission, which was ill-advised, and now I know from experience, was to wish to possibly purchase, if I could, any big fish that come on the market. Mm. And that's why I dug the garden lake, ah. which is now, as you know, been extended and is the office lake. Yeah. Originally, it was just that lake, 70, 
for whatever long in my garden. And I dug that. So if any big fish come on the market, I was going to buy them uh, and keep them in there until I was ready to put them in the lakes. Um, happily, a mega syndicate lake, um, the owner uh, sold the estate and um, uh, pulled the syndicate from under the members and um, had the lake netted and sold them. Um, I missed out on all the big, big net, but I did go down and uh, I got, I got first choice of uh, mm. uh, the first big fish, which turned out to be chunky. <laughs> you know, it went on to be, well, I really believe that Chunky was well over 70 pounds when really? he died. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well over 70 pounds when he died. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was caught as a 60. Um, but, yeah, I was so impressed with those fish when I saw them being netted and being carted away. Um, I kept a track of where they went, and a number went to a lake that was turned into a day ticket water, and that then closed. And so I managed to procure the vast majority of them. And that was the main stock for the cops. Okay. Um, together with a couple of others, um, someone had given me uh, four small commons that they'd caught in the River Chelmer, believe it or not. Four Chelmer commons, yeah. 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 Did they go in the cops? Um, two did. Right. And two went in. Church. Sorry, five. Three went in the church. Um, I can't think of his name. Oh, a Kent guy who originally worked for Kent Waterboard when they were um, rearing carp in the... Um, 60s, he, Ken, Ken, Ken Sutton, was it? Mm. Um, he become manager, bailiff of some big reservoir in Kent. Was that the one the uh, lads did reservoir, whatever one? Oh, Carl and Alex did yeah, it. Yeah, um, oh, I, I don't know, but um, well, it was a big, it was well known for pike fishing because Jim Gibson used to fish it. And it was, might have been Jim that put me on to him. He was um, he was still rearing some fish, um, and he come over and swapped me about a dozen carp for um, I think I think it was a couple of over on brothers or something. And uh, <laughs> we dug a stock pond out here, which is in the far corner. Of, it would be where the far corner of the office lake is now. And um, some of them went in um, the cops, including that. Beautiful um, double linear, mm. yeah, it's still alive today. Uh, yeah, um, I was in essence um, buying fish wherever I could, yeah, because again, from observation, there was there was waters being wiped out um, because fish were being stocked, yeah, uh, and there was waters where I knew that people were stealing fish and chucking them in from here, there, and everywhere. And they seemed very resilient, resilient to uh, any casualties. So I come to the conclusion that um, if you had a single stocking and then later years wanted to stock, you could have a situation like it was like taking the, the common cold to the Eskimo. Mm. You know, you'd wipe the wipe lot out, yeah. as, as, you know, as we know. You know it's, it's devastation when white man went you know, up, up north really uh, had a devastating impact on the Eskimo. Um, so I decided it would be better to mix the strains and take any hit and casualties when they was young mm. uh, rather than you know, try and add fish later if need be uh, and then have a possible you know, disaster. Yeah, yeah. I've always said um, if anyone had uh, stocked Redmar, you know, probably would have wiped them out. You know? mm. um, it is a difficult situation. Um and my recommendation to anyone would be you know, start on that basis, mix the strains so they have um, you know, some resistance. Um, and if you really want to go for it, try and get some river carp because they're the ones who are like viral cesspits. 
Yeah, so, you know, so if they toughen up the rest, then they are. Yeah. I think they're resistant to anything, you know, and because sooner or later you're going to have to, you're going to have to restock. You of know, course you are. You know, carp, you know, carp, like any, any livestock will die, you know, um, time to time, you know, or you could have an issue, you know, and so you need, if you're playing the fishery, to consider, uh, that you will have to restock in the future. So how can you do that safely? Mm. And my answer is by mixing strains as much as you can. Yeah, so in short, um, I had sources from about four or five different places. Um, as I said, the cops were mainly mature fish, upper 20s. Um, the church were... The majority were very young fish. Like I said, I wanted that was my clean yeah. sheet. Start with young fish. Start them on um, a really good food source and see what could happen. How many fish in in the cops? Cops is you say around about acre and a half, bit bigger. Is yeah, it? yeah. We put um, I think I had about twenty in there. Twenty in there, mm. and then churches. Church had about. 70. 70, and that's about five acres? 4.7. 4.7 acres. Without the islands. Without the islands. Mm. Right, okay. Let's go back a bit. Um, I've got a collection of, as I said, upper 20s uh, in the house lake. Yeah. I, I, 20 of them, basically. Well, no, sorry, I'll rephrase that. 30 odd uh, of fish um, from various sources in, in my garden. And I'm heavily feeding them with bodies. Okay. They spawned in the May or whatever. And they spawned in the June and they spawned in the July and they spawned in the August. Thrashy on the surface, you know, all the time. Like, what the hell? Yeah. Then started dying. Yeah. Um Unbeknown to me, there is uh, the real, very real danger that if you throw too much food in a a bait in a lake, it will rot down and then it uh, causes ammonia. The carp thrash on the surface, a sign of a um, a water that's got high ammonia levels is the carp thrash on the surface because their gills, filaments are getting burnt. Yeah, so they're doing it uh, to try and uh, improve the oxygen. Mm. Um, it really was interesting, actually. Um, it didn't, didn't seem interesting at the time, by the way. It seemed a disaster, you know, losing carp. But from then on, um, I realised what had happened at the manor. Um, oh, yeah, you say. Yeah, yeah. And then I say, then I started, you know, I think I told you, I had ladder workers fishing a lake called the arena. Mm. You know, that you know, fish well one week and then not fish for two, three weeks. And I started, I asked him to get me water samples. Yeah. And I could, I could predict when it would start fishing or when it wouldn't, you know, just by checking the ammonia. So this is what I meant by talk to the fishery owners who lived it and killed the fish. Yeah. And I killed you know, at least 10 of those big carp. It was heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. But yeah, I realised they're following me ways and you know, stopped the baiting. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Uh, several of them had sores. When we took them down to, eventually took them down to cops, several of them had sores. One called a scar had this sore on its belly that was, I don't know, two inches across. And oh, it was awful. It was like a quarter inch deep. Ooh, yeah. into its flesh yeah. and I guess that's you know, laying on the bottom I don't know, you know mm. and the bottom is all you know, really acidic I don't know but yeah yeah those poor old things had a really unhealthy happy, unhappy time in, in the in the garden like mm. is it possibly the reason for the huge growth yeah yeah like you know, I told you the story of the sax fish didn't I yeah you know, and the you know, scar you know, in France you know, it's coffee, of course, yeah. It does seem to me that when carp go through massive, massive trauma, especially um, not being able to get to food, that you know, they really do put on weight. If someone was really cruel, they could you know, probably make a mega fishery, I think. 
my theory. I'm not sure how ethical that fishery would be. No, it wouldn't be at all ethical. <laughs> it wouldn't be at all ethical. But it is interesting. You know, say there's several examples. You know, say that the sackfish I talk, spoke about never, yeah. went, never went over 17 pound. Swam around in a sack in Star Lane in Essex for about three months. And, you know, Two, two years later, it was over 30. You know, look, you know, Scar that was tethered. You know, what's his name's like? Luke? Graviers, yeah, Luke Moffat's. Yeah. Um, that went up to 90-odd, didn't it? That went up to 90-odd. Um, I put 20 carp um, in the cops, and 10 of them end up going over 50. Mad. Mad, yeah. In terms of timescale, when did you then open this, well, the cops up syndicate-wise, um, to fish because you said it took three years to sort of if you like cultivate as an environment fish going in obviously the fish were being oh, that's held what, that's what I was going to say yeah yeah. Uh, I opened it after five years five so th- we put the fish in year three yeah and we opened it year five I wanted to give them a couple of years to settle down uh, and again use the opportunity to feed them unmolested mm. Um All that observation and all that planning and patience um, was proven to really pay off, and it's critical. Uh, the, you know, a, long, a couple of years after me, you had Gary. Mm. You know, Gary got his lakes. And yeah. do you know he's talking about people who never listen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, trying to give Gary yeah, uh, the benefit of my thoughts. Yeah. And um, he didn't listen. You know, his ideas was, oh, you know, as soon as these muddy holes are full of water, I'm going to chuck fishing and open it as a fishery, uh, which he did. Um, and he, by the way, um, had a number of fish from the same source as me. You know, the fully scours, all the heavily plated. Mm. Uh, where they come from, Jeremy Driscoll, you know, this guy the um, plants, on their um, site, there was a lake. Right. Um, and they'd, the owner of the site agreed that this fish farmer could stock it and just leave him there. And he was going to come back and uh, get them. I'd, re- I'd love to know that fish farmer was. Because um, you know, these, these are the fish, the stock that one of them become the cuckoo. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd still say the cuckoo would have gone 50 mm-hmm. if it wasn't for that oxygen mm. crash. But, yeah, you know, it's 44. Incredible-looking thing. Oh, yeah, it's 44 and still climbing. The Beauty Queen's another Beauty one. Queen, yeah, 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 yeah. The most amazing fish I've ever seen. Anyway, so this fish farmer stopped, them, and um, then an otter got in. And um, a, a lot of them were killed. And he assumed, I guess, they was all killed or you know, they weren't worth going back for and so he never went back, and uh, they bred. And so Jeremy, on his you know site where they were in all the plants, has got this lake full of all these immensely incredible plated carp. He said, "I could have some." So I went up and caught, I think seven or eight. Where was we, Rachel and Emma? Actually, we had, um, Nigel Bob we just got we went out there several times. Hence, the two biggest were called Rachel and Emma. Uh-huh. Rachel being the uh, Rachel being the cuckoo, and Emma being the beauty queen. And, um, yeah, Gary had some as well. Uh, but where I'm going with this, you know, um, as you know, you know, we ended up with, across the two lakes, 1550s. You know, I've told this story before. I had 1550s, and um, Chris Ball used to keep a record of you know, all the carp over 40 that were caught every year and mm-hmm. publishing the uh, carp talk. He'd come down to the trade show this, this particular year, and I asked him how many English, sorry, UK 50s he thought there was in England. He said 18. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, well, there's a bit more than that, mate, because I've got 15 across my two lakes. You know, so I had nearly as many 50s as the entire UK. UK. Whereas Gary, um, to my knowledge, you know, we've, we've a much better lake. You know, um, his big lake's about eight acres, I think. Yeah. His syndicate lake. Yeah. He's got the other one, yeah. Best of my knowledge, Gary ever only ever reared one fifty, which is a coconut, coconut common. Yeah. And as a well, certainly this summer, I think his biggest fish was forty four. Yeah, and so I'm only saying that to illustrate, you know, how patience 
you know, uh, is the big creator. You know, and that's what it is. You know, so if you want to achieve what I achieved, then you've got to be very patient. Mm. You've got to be very patient. You can't just dig a hole, chuck a load of fish in it. Yeah, and that's proven. That's proven. You know, um, you mentioned about PBs. Is it has it been a week this year when someone hasn't had PB or all the angles had PBs? You know, I I stopped. Count, I lost count around six hundred. Well over a thousand people have had their PBs out of the church, you know, which is very satisfying for me seeing their faces. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. But like I said, it's all down to patience, uh, looking, observing, listening to people, yeah, you know, and working it out. And then the big one is say, it's just letting nature have the time it needs. If I had understood, yeah, the dangers of. Um, Oxygen crashes, God knows what we've had now. You know, so um, you you won't know this. Um, I was over Cavanagh, and um, I mysteriously lost two two of those uh, three commons. Right. Yeah. Um, it was Chippy Dave. He rang me. You know, he's okay, you ain't gonna believe this. What two of your commons have turned over dead? Yeah. You know, only had three. Mm. God's sake. So I had four, I had the uh, power station one as well. That come in. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, two of them just out of nowhere died. Um, and this was... This was very early on. So let's say this was probably 2005. Right. One of them, I think, weighed in at 58 pounds. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, and the other one, I think, was the top 40. Yeah, and then you look at um, you know, the, the first oxen crash. We lost five fifties. Then this is church. Oh, church. Yeah, we lost five. We've lost five fifties in that first oxen crash. So yeah, there. Yeah. So how big, how big that common would be now, and that, that biggest one, and how many fifties we would have now? Yeah, you know, if I'd really understood the dangers of oxen crashes. Wow. Know, which is a bigger problem now than it was then. You know. Um, I, we have Royston, but I wouldn't like to have a, I wouldn't no. like my, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like my livelihood to be dependent on fisheries without uh, oxygen. No, it's, sorry, the ability to put pumps in. It's, it's a very, very <clears throat> rapidly changing world. Um, I know we've gone off subject, but I'm, I'm hoping that you know, some of this, my experiences and maybe fishery owners listening, it will help them you know, not yeah. go through you know, some of the dramas we've gone through. But I was shocked. I think it was about, oh, it must have been probably nearly eight, ten years ago when um, someone said to me, uh, the pike looked like they're struggling and the carp you know, on the top, it was in October. You know, uh, what? You know, yeah. so, so I put the pumps on, you know, problem solved. But that was the first time that we had an oxygen depletion in October. Mm. You know, and now I wouldn't dare switch those pumps off until, well, yeah. well probably end of November. You know, mm. um, you know, we had, a, you know, uh, interesting enough, we had this almost fluorescent green algae bloom on the cops last week put the pumps on, you know, no problem. You know, I'm not at all worried because we've yeah. got the pumps. But I was speaking to um, a friend of mine who's you know, very much into fishery, fisheries and talks to a lot of fishery owners. He said it's happening all over the country. Mm. You know, so suddenly this autumn there's been this really weird algae you know, outbreak and it's without doubt it's global warming. Yeah. You know, and you know, so, uh, you know, the algae, the algae, Outbreak's not the issue. It's when it starts dying. You know, mm. That's when you get the oxygen depletion. You know? So it's scary shit only a fishery nowadays. Yeah. It really is. It's almost like nowadays you've got the need for pumps and the need for, for fencing, realistically. There's two mm. aspects there mm. that, that have got to be in place realistically to protect your stock, especially, as you say, because oxygen crashes happen. They can happen overnight, can't they? Literally within hours. Um, you referenced there when you were talking before about Cavagnac. We're going to come back and revisit church and, and cops and talk about the events that transpired, but also about the subsequent rebirth and the fish that are in there now. But Cavagnac, there's owning a fishery and digging it on site, which is a big enough job. And then there's going, I'll tell you what, 
I'll have one in France as well, mate. Talk me through how you got there. Have you got a handkerchief? <laughs> yeah, I've got some at tissues some point, it needs At be. some point, I'm going to start crying. <laughs> Probably the greatest miscalculation of my life. Really? Yeah. The biggest point is, you know, it was in France. So I'm dealing with the French. <sighs> I've got, I've got so many French mates, bless you, but I will. I will give you stick like you give me <laughs> stick. Um, yeah, how that happened. Um, we had this guy. Let's call him um, Bob. Um, who contacted me, Frenchman, who contacted me and said he wanted to he loved Nash and Nash Bay, and he wanted to start a Nash Bay team and really promote Nash in France. Um, he was, is a con man, and um, this was the start of him getting into me. Um, so, yeah, we agreed, you know, agreed uh, that he could have, for example, um, half a tonne of bait. Yeah, for his whole team over the year explained to me they need lots of bait over the year so he turned up with a huge trade and wanted his half a ton of bait on the spot this is just one story I should have seen through it so we, we give him half a ton of bait off he goes and three months later giving us we have used all the bait uh, Bob but that was going to last you a year yeah. oh yes I know but the boys are doing so whether you so what do we do so in essence what he says what do we do now then sit here for nine months out in your boat you see how you can get for the cons yeah? yeah anyway he said to me one day um, why didn't I have a lake in France I said because I didn't have the energy to look for one well, it seemed quite a good idea this is at a time when you know, the other boys had the quay yeah yeah that was really um, you know, rocking and all that and a week later, he rings him up. Kevin, I have found you a leak. That's a crap French accent, wasn't it? <laughs> what that was. Um, okay. He has um, found um, a 50 acre lake. Um, it was originally part of a chateau, chateau estate. Um, very old. Um, mm. Covered in lilies. It was in uh, the Michelin Guide, not the food guide. They've got a travel guide as a as a, a beauty spot spot to go and visit. So I said, okay, I'll go and look. And I went over and looked at it. And I still got a photo. Well, I had a photo somewhere. I don't know where it's gone. But um, when I come, when I bought, when I'd done the deal on the lake, I come back showed a friend, he said, what, you bought a cabbage patch? <laughs> All you could see was a one acre of water in the middle. The rest was lilies. This is me and my enthusiasm and neat and ignorance. I was soon deal with all with that. Um, so, yeah, um, it was owned by a, um, a guy called Mr. Gavie who lived at the end by the dam wall. Um, the guy, interesting enough, the guy who owned the chateau Gave the lake to Mr. Gavie and the surrounding land. Gave the lake? Gave it to him. Wow. Probably pretty smart. You know, he knew what a massive liability it oh. was looking after it. Yeah. You know, and I don't know whether they got regulations over there where you have to you know, um, look after it. Certainly um, in the winter, um, it can have a massive uh, amount of water come into it. So you've got to um, you know, operate the sluice out you know, into the stream. So probably the bloke's a bit smart, but yeah. And so, yeah, I'd done the deal and um, rented a lake off of this Mr. Gavie and made Bob my partner. The deal was that uh, we would um, bring the anglers in, get the bookings, bring the anglers in. Um, he would run it you know, on a daily basis over there. Um, first thing we had to do was get the lake up to speed. Like I said, we've... we've uh, signed up a lease on 50 acres of lilies um, there it was completely overgrown couldn't get round it um, so it took us two years to um, clear the banks 
um, make pathways around where possible. Uh, there's a number of swims on there which are only accessible by boat. You know, um, mm. Chippy Dave, shout out for Chippy Dave. It become his life for a couple of years. And uh, Chippy uh, Paul and Chippy Lee, you know, um, we all used to go out there once a month, you know, and, and spend a week working on it. You know, so it become Dave's whole life and passion, building you know, huge pontoons. You know. It really was... Um, a work of love, you know, yeah. two years, you know, clearing out 50 acres of lilies, you know, um, building paths all around it, you know, say so building swims. Well, there was a car park, putting a car park in, which I guess from memory say, from the, from the track, 30 metres to the lodge. Mm. That was all... It took when we first got to the lake. It took me fifteen minutes to get through the vegetation to see the lake where the lodge is. You know, so it was a massive amount of work. So we built a lodge, had the restaurant, toilets, showers. You know, it was a, it was a two-year project. It cost me a uh, two hundred twenty grand. Yeah, so effectively two years of blood, sweat, and tears. We had this stunning-looking fishery. Um, I was very keen to lift the bar. You know, on uh, the experience, you know, fishing all day in France. Uh, as, you know, as I said, we built a restaurant, um, had it well kitted out, and I wanted to put a high quality of food on. You know, I'm not saying you know, fine dining, but you know, really you know, tasty, real quality food. That was interesting, actually, um, when we did open. Um, started getting complaints about the food. Do what? You know, it's the best fried breakfast I've ever had in, you know, because, for example, you can't get baked beans, or you couldn't, yeah. we couldn't find baked beans in the rural area of France we was in, and you wouldn't want a French sausage, and their, their bread just didn't toast, so we was trucking in baked beans, English sausages, and, you know, uh, <laughs> white sliced bread, you know, yeah. to just, you know, to make the experience, you know, as good for them as possible. And then they're saying, then I'm getting complaints. What I learnt was it wasn't about the quality of the food, it was the amount. You know, it is interesting. You know, um, for an awful lot of people, they uh, judge uh, a meal by how much they've had. You know, I remember sitting in the lodge one morning, this guy said, Oh, I'm stuffed. I couldn't eat any more. It's coming out of my ears. <laughs> you know, and you know, my local Indian, I, I actually got them to give me, give me half portions. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I can see the, the pressure restaurants are under and why so much food, I'm really digressing here, but why so much food is uh, uh, is wasted because they have to give such big portions, you know, to satisfy, you know, the customers. Well, well over the size that, you know, a large number of slim, gorgeous people like me would want to eat. <laughs> Where was I? Yeah, anyway, so, yeah, we've got it all ready and, uh, yeah, we, um, we announced the opening. Um, then word starts getting back to me that people are trying to put the boot in um, between certain Frenchmen and a certain person in England. Um, they were trying to put the boot in and they were spreading it around that the lake was full of um, nicked fish. Let me first deal with that. This is where I said earlier about you know um, me trying to do the right thing with my lakes, yeah. Um, you know, prove that you didn't need to steal fish from France or well, nick fish from France and bring them over. Bit me in the ass. Um, and I'm going to be very frank and honest. That's all I can ever be. We all make our mistakes in life, and I put my hand up. Um, my partner, Bob wanted to supplement the population of the lake with more fish, right? And he wanted to fish them out of this river. And this lake, this known lake, blah, blah. I, and he had, I think, I think he had gone over there. I got wind of it, had a massive row with him. No way are you taking fish that <coughs> your other French anglers fishing for okay so I knocked all that on the head but I do admit he said to me he had a stretch of the river lot 
which only him and a couple of friends fished and no one else ever fished it. So I acquiesced that he, okay, if he caught anything from there, he could you know, mm. you know, put it in the cabinet. Because despite what people say or were saying, it was not in any way illegal to remove fish from any French venue. If you caught it, unless of course it's private, yeah, if you caught a fish, it was yours. You know, uh, to deal with what you want. And, you know, so, uh, you know, it's fact that um, a lot of French are still um, uh, in those rural areas, probably to this day, still um, taking fish for the pot, especially yeah. barbel. You know, there's a, a river, little river down there full of barbel. They love a barbel, the French, you know. So it wasn't legal, illegal. And Bidu's told me it's only him and two of his mates that fish this stretch. Okay. Somehow... This has got out because it, the word is that I have um, nicked fish, and remember, couldn't have nicked them, from all over uh, south of France and we filled this lake. Um, we're opening and a rumour was deliberately um, put out that the gendarmes had raided us and the lake was closed. It was all utter bullshit. You know, gendarmes never raided us and the lake weren't closed, but... Yeah, you know, I had people ringing me up. Oh, I have my booking, but you are not opening now. You know, you've been raided by a gent. It was a fucking nightmare. Really didn't need it. Good old Ken. I'd like to meet you one day. I'll strangle you, you Cornish bastard. Did I say that? <laughs> you might need to edit that. That's your decision. <laughs> um, anyway, so we opened the lake. Um, and nature bit us in the arse straight away. Um, just so, so the first week we opened it uh, to the press. That's right. Ah, okay, so you had a press week. You had a press week. Uh, yeah. Um, Dave Levy come down actually. You know, he was then still fishing for Nash, a good friend, and he had the biggest fish of the week. I think it was either top, it was either forty nine or fifty. I can't remember. Uh, but it was really tough fishing. The weather wasn't great. It was very windy and cold, but it was really tough fishing because. We've got this weird algae stroke weed uh, bloom. Um, the lake, as I said, was 50 acres um, covered in lilies. Mm. When we've cut all the lilies out and probably, you know, just got little pads dotted around, like probably, I don't know, from 50 acres to 49 acres, I'd just say it's little... Little hole in the middle, yeah. Let's say we went from 49 acres of lilies to five, yeah, six, you know, amount of mines and all that. Um, that allowed the, the light into the lake. Mm. And uh, suddenly we've had this enormous explosion of this. I've never seen it before. You know, it's, it was a cross between algae and a really, really fine, fermentous blanket weed. The net result was that. The wind was blowing it around, and it was like, well, it was like literally fishing through cotton wool, right? Yeah, you know, and so you're right. Dave Levy was using two four ounce leads just to hold bottom, you know, and stop being dragged around. So it was really tough. That then went on for the next few weeks. So you know, my dream of opening this amazing lake in France, you know, with all the services and it was it, it really was didn't start well it was a struggle um and after the two years of struggling to beat the lake anyway and that really i think sums up summed up my whole time at Kavanagh. it was a struggle you know, mm. you know we just i was just we were just bitten in the arse all the time so uh, that weed eventually disappeared and then we had a massive outbreak of blanket weed. Um, incredible outbreak of blanket weed. Like three quarters of the lake uh, was covered in you know, this blanket weed that blew up. Um, and it was effectively unfishable. Yeah. You know, we had to start saying, sorry, you've got to cancel your trip. And you know, me and Dave were over there and the lads, you know, you know just we had um, like, like scaffold boards. We tied three or four of them together, then ropes to the boat. Yeah, you know, we was trying to, you know, 
drag, drag it out. Drag it out. Oh, you just, but as soon as you dragged it out, more would appear. You know, so we had that issue as well for like eight weeks. You know, and then, then the, the next one we had was must rats. Oh, my days. Oh, I've never seen a must rat before. Um, but what must rats do, they swim along, they spot an angler's line, that's their um, uh, their tip. That the end is a bait, and they just follow it down to the rig. Yeah, and we had this huge number of muskrats invade the lake. Yeah, so, you know, so anglers are doing their nut because they wound in in the morning and they've been bitten off. Yeah, you know, and, and then he's like, "You heard Tom telling the story of koi pews. You know, <laughs> you, know, you know, I had the story. Where I was in the boat and they're full of adders. You know, and, oh, fuck it, it's one thing after another. Snakes, muskrats, and koi pews. Mm. What sort of lake have you got yourself involved in here, Cal? Oh dear, yeah. So um, yeah, Tom Tom used to love trapping the koi pews, and so he told that story, didn't he? <laughs> but yeah, um, I don't know where I told it, but yeah, um, Mister Gavey, the owner, he kind of used us, his my staff as as his staff. Yeah. Oh, I need some logs for my fire. Yeah. Okay, yeah, just to keep you know sweet. Yeah. We um. You know, where trees we you know, chopped down, you know, made into logs. You know, we'd go and take up a load of wood for him. And this particular day, I've gone and got a load of logs, put them in the punt, and go up the lake. And something caught, uh, caught in the eye. It's only a flipping the adder in the boat. <sighs> then another one comes out of this you know, log. And another one, you know, and oh. a boat full of adders. You know, what do you do? You just jump out, then you? you know, but, Did yeah. you jump out? <laughs> it's fucking right. Up. <laughs> <laughs> just in the middle of the lake, yeah. With punters fishing it around the yeah, outside, a, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we had um, we had an angler go over the side. Um, I actually saw that. Um, just watching him, watching him out in the boat. He just leaned over too far and flipped the boat. Um, he was semi disabled anyway. Major, major freak there. That's uh, Stuart Demon, a dear old friend of mine. Uh, from Australia, he come over as a manager for a year or two. <clears throat> um, where well, he was there during the form formation of the lake, he lived on it for two years before he even opened it. Um, he roared out, jumped in the uh, speedboat, roared across there, took out I think nine lines of other anglers, yeah. and got to the guy and pulled him in. Oh, it was just drama after drama. Jeez, uh, drama after drama. But, um, Anyway, it's settling down. Um, it's kind of, you know, fish, fishing is now viable, if you like. You know, people are catching. Um, I, I can't remember. Is this probably three years into it, would it have been? Maybe more. Um, is this three years into the fishing or three yeah, years three, into the three, whole? Three years into the fishing. Yeah. Um, maybe more. Wow. So that's taken some time even just there just to steady up, isn't it? Yeah, like I said, it, uh, I spent two hundred twenty grand on it. Um, it actually only made profit of twenty grand one year. The rest of the time, it just about broke even. Yeah. I listened to a podcast by um, Danny talking about you know his one in France. Yeah, and he basically says, you know, if you think you're going to make loads of money, forget it. And now he's so right, you know, you know, um, unless it's you know, uh, owner. You know, the owner lives on it, you know, they make a you know, make a living, you know, but so yeah, if you're employing staff and running it as a business and you know, it is hard to make money out of them. But you know, it was a lovely place, you know. Um I used to go over there regularly and just you know, just for a week's break, you know, from uh, you know, running this lot, you know, and I would never fish. It's it's a fact that if you've got your own fishery, you know, I've said it before, you know, um you don't actually fish it. You know, yeah. Um, you know, mentioned about the cops in the church. I, I spent some time on the cops because when I opened it as a syndicate, the members couldn't catch, and they look at me as if really is any fish in here, you know. So I was set to to prove there was, and actually really got into it because they were, like I said, those from a, mainly from a water um, where they was twenty years old, uh, twenty years of being fished for, so they were really riggy fish, mm. you know. And um, so I got absorbed in understanding how they was getting away with it so much, but. Other than that, um, I just can't fish my own lakes. And the same was um, with Cabernet. But I used to just go over there and just sit chilling with a 
bottle of beer and enjoying the environment and relaxing and you know helping the other hands. I used to love you know taking meals round, for example. Yeah, that's how it ended. You know, come over for breakfast and an evening meal. But a lot of them wouldn't want to wind their rods in, so we used to you know take the meals to them. You know, I used, you know, used to love what you know waiting on the anglers if you like. You know, yeah, you know, um, yeah, and then um. I've gone over there uh, for a week. I was with Chippy Dave, actually. And we got to the airport in France, uh, Rodez, which is near the lake, little, little tiny airport. And as I had my passport over, the passport guy turned his head and nodded. And I looked over, and there's a couple of gendarmes there. And they come over and gave me a bit of paper. And it said, report to the police station. At four o'clock in the afternoon. What the fuck's this about? How many people like, have been quite important? And I've been pulled at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting though, isn't it? So they obviously knew I was on that plane. Yeah, of so, course. So yeah, um, so they've got their uh, ways of you know, finding out. It's also very interesting. All I, all I am is a blipping car bang. Like you owns a little lake in France. What the hell? Yeah, I've been tracked through the you know whoever, the English, you know, to find out I'm on this plane. Anyway, um, so I've gone to the lake and um, spoke to, I had a, my manager then was a guy called David, young lad called David. Is his surname something like Freshner? He's, he's still, he's still got it. We'll come back to that. And he explained to me that my partner, who we've named Bob, um, has been is in the police station being questioned. Oh, what the hell? So I went up to see Mister Covey, and he said he'd been down the police station as well, and they questioned him. Um, and it was about black, paying your staff black, as they call it in France. In other words, not declaring, yeah, you know, paying them cash and oh, right. not declaring the t- uh, tax. That's what it was about. Really, yeah, we are, we are you know, properly run business, blah, blah. Don't have to do stupid things like that. And I'm really annoyed. You know, you know, what the hell? You know, why? Why they dropped this on us? And I knew exactly why. It's it's these troublemakers. Yeah, I had heard a rumour that we was going to get raided because we was paying our staff cash. So I knew where it was coming from. Is coming from, let's say, Mr. Monsieur Le Gob and Monsieur, Monsieur Mr. Ken, shall we just say. So I was fuming and I, I went down that police station with the wrong attitude. Mm. Um, turned up, for some time, and they said, oh, you need to wait an hour. The translator will be an hour. Well, why did you say four? You know, I'm in a really argumentative Arrogant mood, if you like. Why do you say four when you meant five? Apparently, they'd um, organised for an English, a French teacher who taught English to be my translator. Now, this police station was basically a house on the edge of Odes, you know, the front garden, everything all along. So, me being a cocky bugger, I just thought, Sodger, so I've gone out, took me a top off. I had shorts under my trousers, and I'm just sunbathing on the police lawn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that went down well. Oh, right? the police are walking past. What the hell? Yeah. But yeah, I was really trying to make a point, I think. Um, a bit stupid, isn't it? But in retrospect. But yeah, eventually, um, Madame turns up and they start interviewing me. Um, the interview went on for uh, three and a half hours. It's half past eight. <laughs> And by this time, yeah, you know, you know, I've been up since four o'clock that morning. Yeah, you know, I'm very tired and I'm very ratty. Um, the basic crux of it was: um, Are you painting your staff black? And <clears throat> you're not, you know, you're not a, a bona fide business. You're not registered in France. Okay. Well, I had. Um, Checked all this before we got the lake. Yeah. Um, and my accountant mm. said to me that as, because I, I really didn't want to get into 
being a French company because I knew what a, a nightmare it is mm-hmm. you know, compared to the UK. The French are very great on paperwork and think they're the dogs, you know, because they're all precise and all this paperwork, which is why everyone in France tries to get paid in cash because the tax rates are so yes, ludicrous yeah, and everything mad. else. It's mad. You know, um, you know, basically, if you pay someone... Uh, Hundred euro wages, you get another hundred euros in various you know, taxes and that from the government. You know, so but yeah, so um, I, I really didn't want to be a French company, and my accountant, accountants had told us that providing we took the bookings in England, we was paid in England, we didn't have okay. to, we didn't have to open. It was okay. And he's saying, well, you're not a French company. And I'm saying, you are a gender. I'm a policeman with great respect. Oh, I have an accountant. You're not an accountant. My accountants tell me I don't need a French company. So you know, shut up and move on to police matters. You know. you know, so they, I, I had all this like three and a half hours. And in the end, I said, look, I'm very tired. I'm getting ratty. To the extent I might end up punching you in a minute. I, did, I remember said. saying that to him. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. I, I said, so either nick me or I'm going. So they said, okay, you go. We will follow this up. So I went. Uh, Bob eventually turned up and uh, said, yeah, they questioned him. He didn't know what it was about. Lying bastard. And I can't, you'll find out what that means in a minute. Uh, yeah, and then we goes back. Uh, this was sometime in the summer. Um, that autumn, I think probably Chippy Paul come out as well. That there, there was at least two of them. Two of them come out, not only Dave, because they all got letters saying they were it translated as victim. Right. In other words, uh, you are a victim of this. Yeah, no charges. Okay. Do you ever have it where a little thing in the back of your mind, you know, just he's you know, he's telling you something, but it's so so quiet you don't listen to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I later thought, how come I hadn't got a letter? Mm. Yeah, they've got letters saying they're victims, but I've had no correspondence. Next thing I know, um, me. Manager David rings me up and says, I'm caught in the morning. I went, really? He said, yes, and you should be as well. I went, what? He said, yes, you should also be in court tomorrow. I said, well, I don't know anything about it. And unless I'd hired my own private jet, it was physically impossible for me to get to that court, you know, nine o'clock in the morning. You, know, you couldn't drive, driven there in that time. Mm. And, um, well, I suppose you could have done if you'd driven all night. Um, I couldn't have driven there in that time, and uh, there wasn't any flights. So I wrote a letter, faxed it to David, and got him to fax it to the to the court. Okay. I said, do me a favour, go along in the morning. And he's gone along. And the judge read the letter and said, well, clearly Mr Nash knew he should be in court today, and he's not here. I was fined... Uh, 50,000 euros Jeez. and a suspended six months prison sentence. No way for yeah. that. Well, presumably for whatever the charges were. Oh, right. Yeah, I was you know, running an illegal company and paying <clears throat> all my staff in cash. Right? Bob, I can't remember what um, he got whacked for, but he got whacked for quite a lot mm. because... He's my partner in this business, right? And the cheeky sod was claiming doll. No. They nicked him for that. I had no knowledge of it. Such a slippery sod. I had no knowledge of it. The irony of this is that I've never seen such a beautiful house as he lived in. Right. I used to actually say, oh, can I bring friends around to see it? It was a fairy tale chateau, watermill. It was stunning. If it had been over in this country, pick a figure, 10, 20 million. Yeah. He had 100 acres as well. 100 acres? Yes. He used to um, crop, um, oh, flipping out. What's the fungi? Valuable fungi. Head's gone. Um, truffles. Truffles, that's it. 
They used to crop up to 100k of truffles a year. Oh, you're beauty. Yeah. All black, he had told me. All, the old silver cash, yeah. His wife had um, a chain of boutiques, and he's on the dole. Unbelievable. Nightmare. So he got nicked for that. Um, yeah, so this is, again, where ego takes over. I should have just rolled over and paid the fine. Mm. But I... Um, got an ego that about this suspended prison sentence because I haven't got a record and I don't want this on my record. Mm. So I decided to fight it. So uh, contacted a French lawyer. I want to... Uh, um, appeal it. Appeal it. And she said, well, you cannot appeal it. What? The reason I couldn't appeal it, because I'd never had my day in court. Oh, right. Yeah? As she pointed out, they had, they did not serve you. And, you know, she confirmed that even though I'm in England, I should have been served properly. I hadn't been served properly. And uh, so, you know, the judge was bang out of order saying, well, he knew about it, so he should be here. Yeah? I hadn't, they hadn't gone through the proper process, and so I hadn't had, and I hadn't had my day in court. So I couldn't appeal. It's more like, you know, we've got to start again, get your day in court. So we went through that process, and I think it was like 18 months or two years later. I eventually had my court date. Um, I was told to be there at nine o'clock in the morning. Hassan, you couldn't make this up. No. I'm going to have a cup of tea. Have a drink of that tea. I don't... What an absolute shocker of a... What I'm going to say next you couldn't make up. This is already a nightmare, mate. I don't know how you've come out the back of the Cavagnac saga. I didn't realise it was... To this extent, so carry complete. on there. Yeah, and you carry can come on. and say that when you like. I've turned up at court, and all I can say was like, um, it reminded me of a school. You had a stage, yeah, and then you know, all the chairs where all the pupils would sit, yeah, uh, for yeah, what they called it, um, school all assembly job, assembly yeah. job, yeah. Well, on the stage. On the right side, you had three judges, and then on the left, there was a place where you would stand, you know, to, uh, yeah. to say your words. And then all the chairs were occupied, right? We're an audience, okay? Didn't quite yeah. get that, but definitely the public have got that. So whereas in England, you know, say the the, uh, the public would be upstairs uh, in the balcony, wouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They was literally all like this audience. So, right, it's nine o'clock, here we go. Wrong. The first case wasn't me. It was two guys who had marched a pensioner into a bank and got him to uh, clear out all this, his savings, which they stole. Jeez. And I'm thinking, hang on. Yeah. You know, this is a major... I've turned up the wrong Criminal place, case. Am I in the right court? But, you know, <laughs> Mr. Kavee come along and he assured me I was. Anyway, this case went on for about a couple of hours. And they was both found guilty and sent down to the jail, to the jail's uh, cells below. The second case that took us up to lunchtime was a guy done a um, timeshare scam. He was selling land which he claimed had all the drains. He had like a drain hole cover there, but there's no, you know, all, all the <laughs> services. Uh, and he didn't even own the land, right? This is when I realised what a number of the people were in the audience. Those all people he's ripped off. Oh, no. Right? Because you know, he's being questioned and whatever, and someone will jump up and put their three pennies worth in. I've never seen anything like it. So you've got the judges debating. And talking to all the people in the audience. What, just anyone could stand up? Oh, yeah, there? they're all just standing up and saying to the judge and like all getting very vocal. And, yeah. So you've got all this going on, yeah? Yeah. Unbelievable, unbelievable. So that case, like I said, took it us up to lunchtime. But why was I told to be here at nine, right? Uh, he was found guilty. Mm. Goes down. They had their normal French thing of two hours for lunch, didn't they? So he goes back. It's now like early afternoon. I bet you're happy at this. Oh, place, I'm, 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 I'm just overjoyed. We, we have no sooner sat down, and then this bell goes off. All hell's letting loose. Transpires the two geezers who uh, nicked and put in the cell for you know, uh, 
a pensioner. S- yeah, they've escaped. <laughs> escaped. <laughs> they've escaped. Oh, dear. Cut long story short. The number of people um, who are there to face uh, justice has dwindled down. It was like ten cases. Yeah? Oh. So the first one with the pension was the most serious, and it's dwindling down uh, right. to the least serious, right? And it's now quarter to ten at night. And they're still going? There's me and one other guy left. If I remember, he'd stolen a canary or something. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's got to be a wind up. It's not. Stuff's it's true, as I said. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And he was after me. <laughs> and so I've been called up. Um, judge said, what's it about? Told him. It couldn't have been 10 minutes. Bang, not guilty. So oh, You're it, joking. Uh, not guilty. It couldn't have been 10 minutes. All he did say, Mr. Nash, yeah. I do believe, though, you should have uh, registered your company with... In France. Uh, with um, the local, what they call it in this country? Um, can't remember. Yeah, just with the local um, uh, council offices. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, just so they knew you was there or whatever. Right. But yeah, not guilty. I've been that. So all that trauma, Ten drama, minutes. two years. Ten minutes, bang. So, yeah. Hey, one. So I thought, okay, you know, in my drive to make sure we're all absolutely right and above, you know, above blah, 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 blah. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, that's the word I was looking for. Oh, we, yeah. should, we should have registered with the French uh, version of Chamber of Commerce. We sent um, our accounts and everything to them. Okay, This was um, in the July. In the September... I had a letter saying uh, you haven't paid your VAT. You've avoided paying VAT. Um, you owe us, um, I think it was 300 grand VAT and an 80 pound, 80% fine. 80%? 80% fine. Yeah, on that. So it was 500 odd grand. Do what? I got hold of um, the accountant. And he actually transpires. He said, well, yeah, actually, you should have paid VAT in France. Right, well, we paid it to England. Oh, no problem. And he was right. You know, I'm always cynical of these things. We're in a week. We got our money back from the UK VAT offices. <clears throat> and we paid... France. France. But I still owe them this nearly 300 grand in the fine, which I was really, oh. really fuming about because... It was pure innocence, yeah? Yeah, it wasn't, you know, they're saying I tried to defraud them, which is why they put this. It was pure innocence, you know, bad advice by the accountant. And so we, we, didn't, we didn't pay that element, we was arguing with them. And then um, it was the week running up to Christmas. I had another letter. They'd analysed the accounts and come up with a tax bill of, I think it was 280 and again, an 80% fine. Oh, you can't get much worse than this, Kev. No. This is an absolute nightmare. And what had happened, how they come, how they justified that, like I said, I spent 220 grand on the lake. Yeah. We had all the invoices, but Bob was going down, for example, to the, uh, heart, to the uh, timber merchants and just you know, getting an invoice for all the wood, but he never uh, invoiced it to Nash Tackle. Right, because it was an invoice of Nash Tackle, they just threw it all out, yeah, c- which is utterly ludicrous yeah. because Nash paid. Yeah, and we could prove that Nash paid. So you had so, proof of payment through. Of course Nash. we did. Of course well, we did. So yeah, what was going on? The French were on a mission to claw yeah. in as much money as they could, you know, from foreign firms. Uh, there was a, this whole black thing, but they did a purge on um, um, across the country on right. people being paid cash, and they did a purge on any foreign business. And the brief was try and get as much money back as you can, you know. And so it was really 
It's the witch hunt. A witch hunt. Persecution, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Coming up to this, um, we need had an angler drown as well that autumn. You said that. Was this the guy that was sort of hot, semi able bodied and, yeah. and fell in the boat? That's it. That's it. Jeez. Fell out of the boat. Um, yeah, to reiterate that story. Um, we had put firm practices in place, and uh, the punts really, you know, we had two aluminium punts uh, to move around the lake, like I said, deliver meals. Um, you had to make sure uh, anything in them was properly uh, balanced side to side, and otherwise they would flip just like that. Yeah. And so it was my instruction that only David could use those punts and take angles back to their swims, and he knew that. Well, we had a work experience kid over there. Um, father and son had gone back to the lodge, Davies decided to go to the shop and get some backy. Mm. They um, nagged the kid to give him a lift back, and he did, and they didn't sit eagerly in the boat, and the boat flipped. Um, the son stayed by the boat. His father panicked and tried to swim back. He hadn't properly put the life jacket on. That come over his head. Oh, no. Sobbing wet clothes, he sunk. Uh, he was gone. It was only because an angler rapidly uh, rowed out and marked a spot that he, he, so he's, he dragged his hands up his like foot down God yeah um, I had massive nightmares about it massive nightmares I bet you did it. yeah um, it really changed everything you know I'm now thinking not if I'm thinking when you know and um, it caused it caused a rift between me and Mr Kv as well mm. um, you know as a properly run business we need to go for a, a process here of discipline on David. So I went over there to give him a, you know, go for the process of a warning. Um, he then went running to Mr. Kv. Remember, like David's almost become like Mr. Kv's son. You know, Mr. Kv needs any work done. You know, he just asked David to yeah. do it. Like I said, I'd turn me blind eye to it. But um, Mr. Kv turned around and said to me, "You will go before David." I thought, "Do what?" Yeah, you know, we're leasing this lake off of you. Yeah, and you're and and my stuff. You're telling me that. Yeah, yeah. I can't even control my own stuff. Yeah, it? yeah. So, cut long story short, um, we pulled. Yeah. When I we, it was Christmas. I can't, you know, we used to shut it down for Christmas. Um, I mean, Chippy Dave and that went over. We went and got all the gear. You know, the pumps down the lake are the ones out there, and uh, we just pulled. And I wrote it off. Um, because I wasn't going to pay those fines, you know. So I just walked away. I just walked away. It wasn't fair. It's you know. a good job you were pretty headstrong and argumentative, mate. Because if you weren't, you would have paid all those anyway before proceeding that without actually pushing. We for couldn't it. afford it to. Yeah, that's it, what I mean. It, it would have uh, put us under. Took you under, yeah. Yeah, you know. But um, yeah, I'd say yeah. I've I've always been very clear on what's right and wrong, yeah. and this this wasn't right or fair. You know, so, you know, saying what with the Mr. Kavee thing, that was a final straw to me. Uh, yeah, so, so, so we just walked and I just walked away from the 220 grand investment, all the great work we'd done. And the irony of it is that David now runs it to this day and he's making bloody good money out of it, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you a story right at the end here, you know, about uh, that went on a, a recent event involving David. Yeah, so, um, we walked. How many years was that in total, your involvement? Two years getting it sorted. About eight, I think. Eight years. Mm. Jeez. But it's going to bite me in the arse, continue to. Uh, we, before in France, um, if you know, a shop would contact me for mm. Nash gear. Mm-hmm. Okay, but now, you know, say the business is rapidly growing, maturing, and we decided, decided to start proper distribution into France. Um, trouble is, in that area, my name is shit. Yeah. Right? Because I'm getting blamed for loads of fish being nicked by Bob and put in the lake. Sorry. Yeah. I would agree that Bob 
had told me he'd taken some from one stretch of a river, him and his two mates, Nick, but not not loads of fish from the whole river. Lot's been raped, this lake's been raped, this lake's been raped, and it's all my fault. You're guilty by association. Well, I'm guilty, apparently, because... I own the lake, mm. right? And so I, you know, I had the fish stolen, remember? They weren't stolen. Yeah. Uh, and put in the lake. I didn't even own the fucking lake. I just leased it off to Mr. Kavee. You know, Mr. Kavee and Bob was, you know, this thing. Anyway, there was a, a French magazine that was really trying to um, wind it up for Nash. And the French salesman I'd taken on was really worried you know, that um, it was really causing him grief and uh, it was difficult for him to sell Nash product in the south of France because I had such a bad name. There is a French show every two years called Mollison. Mm. We'd already um, engaged the French Federation you know, when we decided to uh, drive start pushing into France. We'd already engaged the French Federation and agreed to sponsor their uh, their team, the carp fishing team. And the French Federation run Monisson. And the president said, well, you know, I talked to him about it, how upset I was about it. You know, this this is what I meant about you know, the irony. You know, I started my, fish, my uh, tackle career in carp, Conservation safety sacks, yeah, yeah, yeah. My mission with the church is to illustrate that we can grow great fish. You don't have to nick them from France, yeah. <laughs> and I'm being bloody labelled, you know, you know, the bandit and the biggest fish nicker in the south of France. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It really, really was hurtful to me. You know, someone who says I only ever had carp fishing and its interest in, you know, in, in, in to heart and mind you know, to be have this awful black. Yeah. So the president, I said, well, what if I come down to the Monison show then and we have it out with all the with all the uh, critics, Mr. Le Gob. I won't tell his proper French name, oh. but Mr. Le Gob being the one leading this band with his puppet, dear called Ken. Spreading rumours and just yeah, generally yeah. trying to. So he said, oh, very good idea. You couldn't make this up. You couldn't make this up. You ask Adam. Me and Adam go over there. And um, we are shown into this room, which has got a raised little stage. Um, To the right of me, uh, there's a woman who's going to be my interpreter. She'd just been away, by the way, with some government department interpreting for them. That's how high level she was. Oh, decent. I've got Alan next to me as well and the French president. <clears throat> if I looked out, to the right was a load of um, uh, people sitting, men. That was uh, the French carp fishing community, right, who are there to say what they want to say. Right. On the left is the French journalists. Okay. And at the back is a bank of, I don't know, six, eight cameras, TV cameras. Are you joking? Nope. This is going to go out live throughout the day at the conference. They're so, going to broadcast this live yeah, on French yeah, TV? Yeah, at the Mollison show. What? Yeah. In fact, I'm reliably informed, if you look far, hard enough on YouTube, you can still find it. <laughs> I might have to do that. Okay. So it it all starts, and basically this uh, Mister Le Gob, you know, he really was the Gob. You know, he's out to prove what a great man he is, what a big man he is, and he's gonna you know, absolutely slaughter me. And um, <clears throat> he starts going into it, and I was shocked because he started listing. <clears throat> All the waters, you know, it's not just one short stretch of river that uh, Bob fished with his two mates. He's listed um, well-known stretches of uh, French rivers where French angles and well-known lakes. I didn't know anything about it. Oh, no. I did not have a clue what Bill had been up to in his efforts to make the, you know, the, the best fishery in the south of France. So he'd have the earner, you know. I, yeah. I was absolutely shocked. 
And all I could say is, look, as a boss, I take responsibility. I was unaware of all this, but I take full responsibility. And I'm very, very sorry. What more can I say? He just wanted to just keep going on, on and on. And it went on for about an hour and a half of him just, you know, just, just basically just slaughtering me, even though I put my hand up. I said, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Didn't know about it, but I take responsibility. And that was in essence, uh, I think it was about three or four hour, uh, if you like, court case. Yeah. Yeah. A live TV court yeah, yeah, case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, all I could say is, I'm sorry. So what were the repercussions on that? Obviously, you'd given up at that time in terms of the venue, but I'm guessing there wasn't any subsequent netting and, and taking the fish back or, or doing anything like that. It was just left as it was, was it? Well, the fish, you know, you know, this is utterly immoral, yeah. what, what um, Bob had done, but it was legal. Remember, yeah, true. remember, yes, yeah, you, yeah, you catch yeah. a carp, it's yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is where it was also so... Um, so bad of Le Gob and Ken because I'm being you know, accused of being the fish stealer. Sorry, technically by law they were not stolen. Yeah, but morally, absolutely outrageous what he did. But know, by the letter of the law, you're fine. The letter of the law, I'm fine. You know, uh, yeah. You know, all I could say, uh, you know, was I was really, really sorry, really sorry, and I set responsibility. What, what more can I say? Yeah, you it, can't. You know? yeah, I was absolutely shocked and really over it. Anyway, uh, you wanted to know the um, repercussions, the, the out, the, the, what yeah, happened, right? What? <laughs> um, at the end of the show, um, they had a disco like party. Yeah? Right. Yeah. Um, me and Alan were invited on stage as the sponsors of the French team. We got a standing ovation. What? <laughs> Couldn't make it up. What Only is the going French. On? Only the French. Only the French. What a chapter, mate. Would you, w- big question. Would you ever own or get involved in a fishery in France again? 100% no. <laughs> I would not. Do you know, I haven't been back since you know Mollison. Um, I used to love uh, you know, the French, you know, the French countryside, the lakes, the culture. Uh, yeah, you know, as you know, I'm a great foodie. You know, you know, I do acknowledge they were once the great chefs, best chefs in the world. You and Nigel on Dadaire and things like that. They oh, were all yeah, like all there. But you know, I haven't been back. It's it's really tainting me uh, about uh, ever going to France again. Or you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it killed my love affair with the country, uh, and. I wouldn't buy a house. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have any involvement with him. Yeah, you know, and that's a very. He is kind of interesting. Uh, the different cultures and the different laws. You, know, you see, for example, the number of people who bought houses in Spain. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, done everything legitimately, and then uh, they've lost it. Mm. Yeah, you know, they've lost it. You know, in fact, I'm a friend of mine. Um, yeah, he lost a house in Spain. Um, yeah, you know, and he told me the story and. I, I couldn't see. I couldn't see. I would have done anything different. Yeah. You know, so you have to be very, very careful when you're having transactions in a foreign country. A, because uh, translation of their laws. B, being able to translate their laws or whatever, because you know you understand the language. You know. But the French are, you know, like I said, I've got a lot, lots of French friends, and I love the bits, but. They are strange lot. Oh my days! Mm. That whole chapter, I never knew Cavagnac was that much of a shocker. Mm-hmm. In and out from day one. I think the only recollection I've had of it is Tommy talking about his time on there mm. and the clientele base and, and a bit about the fishing. But the whole backstory there, tax, police, wasted time, money, effort like that is that's enough to like put your fisheries for life. Well, yeah, I did. Yeah. Forget, you know, I'm not saying glibly, forget the 220 grand, forget the court case, whatever. You know, what really burnt me was um, the opinion you know, a large <clears throat> number of French people had of me. Yeah. You know, you know, which you know, you know, it was, you know, I believe, I was, I was as innocent as anyone else. You know, I, was, mm. I was absolutely done over by you know, a Frenchman you know, who we were called Bob. You know, absolutely done over. <sighs> And then, conversely, over all this time, I think we left 
church and cops. We talked a little bit about an oxygen crash, but you basically built in the UK two lakes where we told about Chris Ball. There was 15 50 pound plus fish, which is just ridiculous. And then you've had your own dramas with the lakes up here with regards to oxygen crashes and, and losing fish. So the church had the oxygen crash, obviously the subsequently church, lost. The church had two oxygen crashes. One was when you were on the big pit with Al, wasn't it? That's right. That's right. And what happened there was... That I've, so, so yeah, the patience game mm. continued on the church, um, just basically feeding them and leaving them alone because it's a very great fact. Um, if you want big carp, then they need to be neglected. As soon as they start being fished for, their growth will definitely slow down. A, because they're nervous to feed, and so they feed slower. And B, if they if they you know, have any damage, tissue damage or whatever, all the, all the energy is going to repairing that, which slows down their growth. Um, so, you know, the game was to leave them alone for as long as possible. I then, there's no point in having a fish, a fishery and beautiful carp if you can't see them come out. You know, so, yeah. so yeah, I wanted to see them come on the bank. I've never had an issue about people catching my carp. You know, never. You know, I, I get great joy when I see them on the bank and how beautiful condition they are and most importantly the big smile on the, on the person's face. But you know, So I, I let people start fishing it just because I wanted to know, see their progress. In fact, um, one of the first was Dave Levy's. I think it's Dave Levy's best friend. He mentioned him his regularly podcast. in his podcast. Yeah. I think that was a guy. Um, Dave asked me if I'd do him a favour. It might have been his birthday or whatever. And, yeah, and uh, he fished it. And I think he had two fifties on that week. You know, wow. Um, so I was, I was selectively letting people fish. Um, I wanted to open it, but I didn't know how. Yeah, because I didn't want it to. I didn't want my fish to get trashed by noddies, you know, and everything. Mm. Anyway, um, I think it was pressure from the reps. You know, shops. You know, we'd, we'd had the trade show here. Shops had walked round. Oh wow, any chance of fishing it? So yeah. the reps are putting pressure on me. You know, to, you know, just all oh, the wheels for them. So I decided to open it to retailers. Um, Selective retailers, basically to help the business, if you like. Uh, and <clears throat> as you say, this particular week, me and Alan were on the uh, big pit and I got a phone call uh, that the fish were in distress. And what had happened, uh, there was um, a, a shops coming off yeah, who had seen the carp in distress, but didn't want to lose, miss their session. And so they had not told anyone that there's carp gasping for air on the top. Oh. And then the next lot of anglers come up and one walked up and said, what the fuck's going on here? Immediately notified, you know, um, the office and we shut it straight away. But it was too late. Yeah. Um, one thing I will observe, um, when carp do go through a auction crash, it really is awful for them. Um, yeah, the stress on them is enormous. You not only lose the fish at the time, but we was losing fish three, four weeks later. Yeah. You know, it's an awful uh, time for them. Uh, yeah, and we lost um, five fifties. Um, I lost a cuckoo. I lost what we called the friendly common. Uh, about another four, six forties. You know, it was, Jeez. Yeah, geez. Exactly that, like... That. You can't quantify the the sort of I don't know the, the the pride in making it from scratch, the pride in seeing it flourish, but then the devastation of that is just I don't know, mate. I don't know if if you'd be, if I just drain them and fill them in. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it was heartbreaking. Um, kind of. I think what helped me with it, and this is, might sound a bit bizarre, but what helped me with it, I was used to the grief and the sadness. You know, I'd had you know, the, the ones that I killed, if you like, by overbaiting the garden lake. And what I haven't told you, um, <clears throat> we had two years of 
um, high mortalities uh, prior to this. Um, I, it's no secret. I put it in writing, and uh, I put it in published it in Cartwell, not to have a a dig at Mark Simmons, but rather to say, look, you need to change your ways because we need you uh, to supply quality carp, you know, f- for the future of the fisheries. But the fact was, um, I bought. I think it was 30 or 40 um, fish off of Simmons, mm. four-year-old fish. And when they come in, I wasn't impressed with them. They, you know, they weren't pretty fish, relatively n- n- nude. Um, but two years after I had them, they started turning over straight after spawning time. And they all uh, were spawn-bound. Um oh. Um, I believe at the time, and so I, this is no secret, I put this all in uh, print. I believe that uh, Mark was force feeding his fish uh, with two old rich pellets in an effort, you know, to commercially um, get them to size and make money. So, you know, he was taking shortcuts, if you like. Uh, and as a result, um, it messed up the organs. Of those fish, um, this so I lost fish basically two years uh, in a row, um, and it was got you know it was getting so bad. Dave was ringing me up and saying, "Oh, like you know, another five dead down oh, here," no. and I just couldn't go down there. I just say, "Dave, just you deal with it. You bury him." You know, I just couldn't couldn't yeah. face. You know, so we lost in essence the whole lot. It was for, it was forty. I'm sure, it was forty over two years. Forty. We lost the whole lot. And very expensive, you know, in terms of I bought those fish at, say, average of £12, but now they're well in their 20s. Oh, yeah. You know, so, you know, so there's a very uh, big financial hit. To, you know, to, I could deal with it, but uh, that could have finished a lot of fish. Yes. You know, which is why, I say, I was critical of Mark and I published it, but it was not, you know, vindictive. You know, it was to say, look, you know, you need to look at how your your working practices because you know we need you you know as, as a uh, as a source of uh, you know quality fish going forward and, and I think you know, he had for you had a hissy fit hating me for a year or two didn't talk to me that's him you know he's like that we're not talking now at the moment <laughs> that's what he's like um, uh, but yeah I, I absolutely believe that article. Uh, was right and it shook him and he's got his act together because then on he was producing some really great fish do you regret not fishing for those fish yourself you fish for a f- the cop like fish and a few of those but the, the fish in the church do you regret not having a a time to be able to catch them and see them for yourself or was that not the main motivation of that it's a question i've never been asked and i've never thought about um i've seen fish come out of the church I thought oh my god yeah, that is awesome yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. I would have I'd love to catch that I'd love to have that on my CV but that is just you know at the instant you know um, I never like I said if you've got your own personally for me and I know some others I can't fish my own the fish I own yeah. I do not understand why that is I do not understand why as I say I really got into the cops for a time uh, <clears throat> that was over the challenge of catching them. You know, um, the two films I made on there, I really fished hard in them and I enjoyed it. But, you know, as I say, other than that first time, that you know, trying to try to, to, to prove to the syndicate that they were in there and then I really got into how tricky they were. So that's more about the carp angler wants to understand and learn them. That yeah. was a buzz for me. Yeah. It wasn't really that I wanted to catch them, you know, just to say, look at me with that. Uh, and, yeah, I, th- I think the same applies to the church. Um, no, I wasn't really bothered. I never caught any of them because, um, yeah, you know, it wasn't what it was about. It wasn't what it was about. You know, it's, it would have, it meant, it means and meant much more to me to seeing someone holding, mm. you, know, you know, one of those stunning fish, you know, been blown away by it than it ever would for me saying you know, here's a picture of me with it look, look at me with it you know how, how did you react to especially sort of early days when it was all in its prime and those fish were hitting big weights and, and people were catching 50s 
for fun. And there was the whole stigma around people saying it's, it's sort of Nashi's back garden lake and sort of downplaying it all. And if you like slating it, how, how did that affect you? Or did it, did you not even bother? Did it not bother you? Yeah. yeah I, I'm very sensitive. Um, people may not realize that. Yeah. I'm all front. I'm very sensitive. Um, yeah, and yeah, I think go back to the beginning, um, that sensitivity really showed itself when you know, I decided, if you like, to walk away from you know, this carp scene and fishing the syndical walls and all that because you know, you know I was getting targeted, mm. you, know, you know, with unfair criticism, you know. So um, it did rank. Well, you know, it was Paisley who started that, and I make an observation that Tim is a friend he's been a you know, friend for, for many years since I've written for him but you know we have had you know some rails and he used to have um, a, col- a column in the back of his mag yeah uh, what was it called Snide Rooms or was it that yeah. Halls one you know <clears throat> what I mean I know the one you yeah. mean where he used to think it was humorous to uh Dig people out in whatever way, and yeah, yeah, there is human humour. Um, I don't think Tim Pace has got knows anything about humour, uh, but I also, I'm saying this honestly, and you know, so if you're listening, Tim, this is what I believe. I also believe that Tim had a chip on his shoulder about Southerners, and particularly about me. He almost felt, um that we were superior. And so he would do anything he could to dig at Southerners and me. And it was him who started that back garden thing. You know, uh, how, can you, how can you say, what is it, um, 11 acres? That's one hell of a back garden, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's you know, not and, and, and it's like a 350-metre walk you know, to the church. How can you say that's your back garden? But you know, you know, just by definition of saying that... You, it gives a sense you're trying to demean something or someone, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I never, yeah. I never, whatever. Yeah, you know, so it wasn't worth arguing with Tim because he's you know very, very strong and vocal on his belief or opinions. You know, just let you get on with it. So, but yeah, so it got branded that. And the other thing um, that was very real, you know, is now moving Echo. Yeah, Echo has manifested into well, unless you fish Yately, or unless you've done you know ten years on X Water and never caught a carp, it don't count. You know, yeah, you had this real clicky lot. You know, it only counts if it's from so so certain waters. You know, and you know they 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 took pride in blanking. <laughs> I remember um, who was the editor of um, Advanced Carp. Martin Ford. Martin Ford. Martin Ford. Yeah. I remember um he was he was going to down to Yatey every weekend. Right? And he hasn't got much carp fishing ability, bless him. And he's blanking. You know, you know, I think he'd been going down for like two or three years. Yeah, you know, and he'd come into the uh, our trade show, yeah. You know, and oh yeah, talking about Yatey and I said, Martin, what exactly are you call? And he said, well, I haven't caught anything. What? You know, and I actually wrote once in the cart world that you know, something like this, and you know, I said, if I could be bothered to go down there, you know, um, <laughs> I would catch him. And I feel ashamed if I didn't, didn't catch him in the first or second session. I got slaughtered for that, but, yeah, I did it deliberately. Mm. Yeah, you Because know, there's this thing about, you know, this is all that culture, you know, unless you're on Yeti, for example, you're not a carp angler, it don't count. You know, and, you know, unless you're catching... Yeah, you know, X fish from Yate or whatever water they don't count. Mm. You know, so it was all in that. You know, so whatever, whatever. You know, um but I wasn't fishing for them anyway. No, yeah. You know, you know, I've been no. to say that. You know that 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 mission I went on to. Um, um, I got into the cops, but you know, say so that was for me to try and understand. I was using it basically for experiments and testing. Yeah, testing um, exactly. Because what I've never said. Um, they were getting around my blowback rig. 
the tube blowback rig. And in my head, where do I go from there? Yeah, that's your, your yeah, best clothes. Yeah. On the where do I go from there? Yeah, they they were clearly doing me on the, you know, and they say, so I was, I was, A, when I just realised it, very upset. But, you know, B, I, you know, I was on a mission to try and find out how they was doing it and how I got around it. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it's, I've become a bit obsessive in it, but, but you know, they couldn't slag me off because I didn't give a damn. I wasn't saying, oh, look, I've caught another 40 or I've just caught two. But I, I did say I caught two fifties on the top in 10 minutes because we made a film. You know, we wanted to make money out of it. But, you know, it, it never meant a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because um, nothing meant a lot to me then, really. You know, my carp fishing career, as I said, was over. Yeah. You know, it's just... What? Why, did, why didn't you open the cops up, do you think, like you have done subsequently with the church for people to book on or even like, not a day ticket format because it's not a day ticket, but wh- why don't you think that ever happened? Because I wanted to catch Chunky again. Did you? I, it's a really interesting story. Um, I caught Chunky at, well, I said 59.14. You know, um, if you ever watch Monster Pursuit, mm. you see the, the arrow go past into the 60s. Dave Levy pulled me on it. He, he was, he said, you've done yourself. That was definitely 60. I wasn't going to argue. You know, I just, you know, I just didn't want to call it 60, if you like. Yeah. They would have caused me a load more shit. <laughs> You know, so I was very actually yeah, just uh, it's just great fish for the film, and then uh, a few weeks later, Mark caught it. Um, yeah, in the famous float of the incident. Yeah, with Cash Farnham, uh, sixty-one something was it? Yeah, it was over sixty. Mm. And I kept popping over there. You know, there was people occasionally fishing it. I let fish it. But I kept seeing Chunky and I just kept seeing it growing and growing and growing. You know, and I thought, well, I'd like to catch this fish just to illustrate what is possible to do with a fishery. Mm-hmm. You know, so that was that was what it was about. Yeah, you know, I wanted to I wanted, if you like, to catch the first seventy pound carp. Yeah, that from an made. English fishery that yeah. I made. Yeah. Yeah. I would never have claimed a record, uh if for no other reason. It wasn't about that for me. Uh, but I just wanted to catch, I just wanted to, if you like, produce, we won't say catch, yeah. produce the first 70 pound carp in the UK. Yeah. And Chunky, in my mind, was definitely between 73, 75, so Jeez. I was convinced of it. I was convinced. Of it. And I'm good at looking at carp. And so I was convinced that, you know, Chunky was well over 70. Oof. But I didn't want to fish. I didn't want to fish the place, you know, and I didn't want to go through the process of catching fish after fish until I got to it, right? So my approach was I wanted to catch it on a floater, mm. right? What I never realised was, until after it had died, that I was never, ever going to catch it on a floater. Why not? Because you only ever caught Chunky on one method, and Mark had caught it on a floater. It wasn't until the lights didn't come on until it was too late we found her dead. That's how clever that fish was. Never got caught in the same method twice. And so I've been vain. You know, it was interesting. When I'm not going to go into the, the, the whole story. I think the way Mark has bigged himself up with that captured chunk is, is somewhat bemusing. But basically... Um, he hooked another fish. I uh, allowed, allowed, they'd never been fished for on the top. And for the sake of a film, I acquiesced and allowed uh, him to have a go on a floater. Um, I then come back to the office, went down, and he's holding this fish. Well done. Film's done. Happy days. Then Nick, who was making the film, Nick Reed, said, I can't use it because he was so pissed off that it was only a 30. The film was about the joy of carp fishing. So, really angry, I agreed. Well, to, he was angry it was a 30? Yeah. What? Yeah. He was really pissed off that it was only 30. It was a, it was a double linear, I've told oh. you about it. The most beautiful fish in the lake. But he was pissed that it was only 30. I argued the fuck with uh, Nick for like half an hour. 
but he wouldn't have it. He said, I cannot use it. He said, I'd face like, you know, he found a penny and lost a fiver. So I'm really pissed, but I agreed that he could have another go. Anyway, Cash Farnham catapulted a handful of mixers out. Cash Farnham cast a rod out, gave it to him. Chunky straightway come up and took it. That's how easy it was. That's how easy that fish was because it had never been caught in a floater before. And it never, ever took one again. Never, ever saw it on the surface. You didn't even see it take didn't it? Didn't even see it. I saw it on the surface layers, but I never, ever saw it take a float again. I kicked myself. Uh, yeah, I should have put the hours in and got it on a different method. Yeah, and then uh, gutted after, you know, it's always spawning. You know, it's, yeah. Yeah, only fishery owner. If they've got really big fish, it was a real scary time at spawning because the younger fish just you know, smashed the head out of the old girls, you know. It once struck me, the revolutionary way to go forward with fisheries is to um, sex test them and have a yeah. lake with all females. Yeah. Then you wouldn't have the issues of spawn-bound fish and all that either, I don't think. Mm. Uh, yeah. Or, or think all that. males, or all males. But, you know, so, um, it'd, be, yeah, it'd be better for... Um, uh, that delicate spawning time, mm, definitely. That's right. In terms of the lakes, subsequently, sort of after that period... When I think I first came onto site, that Cops Lake was drained completely down. Mm. The church was... Well, did, you, know, you mentioned that before. You had to tell people that's um, that's because of years of blanket weed. Mm. Um, I didn't manage it properly. I didn't realise uh, how bad that was for the environment. But basically, the blanket weed layered up on the bottom until you've ended up with a stagnant, silty uh, mess. Um so the only the only solution was to drain it, pump it out, and scrape all the bottom, which is what we did. You know, um, I've always believed the uh, the life of the of a lake is peak richness is fifteen years anyway, and then they slowly you know, deteriorate. Mm. So it, it was a good exercise, and another part of my learning curve with fisheries yeah. to to re um, revitalise it. And, and we filled it up two years ago, and we'll probably open it. Not not next year, the year after. Once again, that patience game. And those so, fish are so in there, mate. Those fish have been in there. Yeah. Um, well, I left it. Only left it a year. Yeah. Barren because um, I know that you know you. It wasn't all scraped out. It was just the bottom. So there would have been a lot of stuff in the mud and all that. You know. So I knew it. You know. I know the, the a lot of the uh, f- food I f- food sources were still in there. Yeah. You know, and all the reeds were all in there. So I, I deemed. We'll just leave it empty for a year before we put the fish in. As I say, um, I'm giving the fish two, three years. It's incredible watching them, going up and watching them, mate. They'll be, well, they are amazing fish as they are. They're lovely scale things. The fish upon fish are they, mate? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. they're absolutely They're not all fish upon us as they're because we've got some of the originals. But but again, you know, that that really does illustrate what I mean about pressure. You you can walk down that lake any day of the week and you'll see them, won't you? Yeah. You won't see them on the church. Nah, you, you know, definitely won't. The difference between the church ones a fish for and they ain't. Yeah. But then that place, I mean, in the time that I've been here, I've luckily fished it a couple of times. The fish on there, mate, are just, it's obscene, isn't it? Mm. It's absolutely obscene. Yeah, it is. I think I've seen Alan Banks Houdini at the start of the year. That's got to be one of the best looking fish I've ever seen on the bank. The four by four, you've got that big common that's just been out this week that's done over 50. Like, there's an incredible head of really, really top notch carp in there, mate, isn't there? Yeah, um, beauty is everything. Weight's not everything. No. Uh, we are fortunate we can kind of balance the two. I will say um, the weights are a bit down now. Uh, yeah, the, the two fifties are always fifties. Yeah, now they're swinging into the forties. Um, so the two remaining fifties. Um, that's because the biomass has gone up. You know, a lot of the younger fish have you know, really put on weight, and uh, it's a real juggling act for me because you know I'm about wanting to breed and you know create fishery with the biggest fish, mm. but but my customers want to catch really big fish. But not, they don't, you know, they, they, the, the anglers on there, they're not, you know, the, the hardcore Terry Hearns, you know, they're not all out for 50. You know, uh, if they can catch great uh, great 30s and a 40, that's their dream come true. Yeah. You know, so 
is a, the, the fishing has just got better and better. You're talking an average. If the anglers know half what they're doing, you're talking an average 10 to 15 bites a week, yeah. which you know, that is great fishing when you're talking about you know, 30s, upper 30s and 40s, you know. Um, so I'm trying to get that balance, you know, so anglers can enjoy really good sport uh, and catch a fish of a lifetime. Because, you know, I, I never said that one of my objectives was the church – was to make it attainable for a working man to catch a fish of his dreams. Yeah. Um, that was a really big mission for me. Yeah, and that's why um, we try and keep the pressure off as much as we can. I don't open it weekends. It's only open five days a week. And we shut it for a very long winter. And then, of course, when they spawn, you know, the actual number of months is open a year. You know, it's well less than six. Mm. You know, and that's because... You know, I uh, effectively would struggle now as a as a still a working man to find a water where I had a chance of you know catching forties, you, know, you know, on my two days a week, yeah, you because know, it'd be so I've crowded and there'd be so many full timers on it. So I wanted really to create this place where you know, a, you know, a keen carp angler, who you know, you know, had half an idea what he was doing, however. He had to work for a living, support his family, would have the opportunity. You know, and that's what we've achieved. You know, and that's why it's probably the most amazing lake in the country. Yeah. You know. It's like going to France without being in France. The atmosphere up there, mm. the sort of relaxed, the lodge, the way you fish it, everything is is sort of encompassing of that, really. And I think none more so than in recent times when travel's been restricted, the, the sort of that type of venue, not that there's anything really like it, but that where it's to yourself – you have that peace, you have that sort of tranquility and, and that ability to just you versus fish rather than being the rat race and the quality of fish in there. It is, yeah, it's an incredible place, mate. You, you, yeah. I mean, you've got to be proud of it full stop as a site because it's come an incredibly long way since you decided to dig it to what it is now. You, you've got to fish it to get it. And, <clears> you know, COVID has really done me a favour. Um random people coming down and you know i didn't wouldn't know them from adam you know the fishing skills or whatever um whereas i, mean, I think covid made a lot of people look nearer at home mm. um and so you know, so we had more people turn up and they got it you know and then fell in love with it yeah and I like those people and thought, you know, so I've now got a really great number of regulars, you know, people we've got really friendly with, you know, um, that is the other great thing, what he's done, of course, it's, um, you know, it's, I've met people that um, have become, you know, really great friends, you know, um, mm. you, know, you know, Ben the Plumber, for example. You know, Ben's a great friend of you know, all of us. You know, you go, whenever Anna's got a party or I've got a party, he's always there. You know, friendly with his wife and the girls. That come from him doing a session up there. Yeah. You know, great. I've got my own plumber now to call at midnight, but he wish he's never had that session. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, 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 but uh, yeah, um, it's, it's become almost like a, a social club. Yeah. You know, and, you know, the lodge, you know, the, you know, the lodge... The lodge has got a better kitchen in it than I've got at home, you know, that's and that's nice, you know, a big yeah. shout to Swanee, you know, um, Milton Keynes, go on fishing. You know, um, he he fell in love with the place. He brought his friends down. He brings customers down. And, uh, yeah, he's, you know, he's, he's, I suppose he's, he's taken over from Chippy Dave and he's keeping the uh, the lodge going. But he, he fit the, done all the lodge up and fit the new kit, kitchen in yeah. it for me. Bless him. You know, bless him. On, nice. his, uh, on his time and money. You yeah. know, that's... That's what the place means to so many people. They fall in love with it. You know, they just just love being here. And I love having them here because of their passion and you know, enthusiasm for it. Do you think it would ever get to the stage that it's at now in terms of the quality of the the fish, the fishing and, and just the water in general? Did you did you believe at that early stage that you could get to that? Oh absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love if, that. My only disappointment is like I said, um, I didn't understand the dangers, you know, and I uh, lost, I lost so many of the, you know, the absolute best carp in, you know, England, you know, in that, in that fish kill. 
That's my only disappointment. You know, instead of talking, we've got two fifties. I should be able to talk. We've got seven fifties. Yeah, and we've got and we've got a fully scale that you know I believe would have gone fifty eventually. Yeah, you know, the biggest uh, fully scale the country's ever created. You know, and say the friendly common. I just, you know that, that friendly common. What a character. Mm. You know, um, there's some plays, mate. There's some fashion. I'll tell you a story about a friendly common, right? It, um, it was caught in a DVD we did, and this is when GoPros first come out. And you, you, I can't remember what film it is, but if anyone remembers the film, it'd be there somewhere. Uh, whoever caught it, we put it back, and we had a, a GoPro on the end of a landing net, right? And uh, we put that in to watch it swim off, which it did. It then turned round <laughs> and come back and, you know, gave us a, a full full face shot as it's looking into the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's how friendly that fish was. <laughs> oh, mate. Character. I mean, yeah, something to be proud of. You're not, you've left a legacy full stop. You're an absolute legend, Kev, in terms of everything you've done in the trade. But that is a tangible mark on the landscape. And those lakes, mate, the cops will be incredible as soon as that's open, the fish in there. It the will. church... It just never ceases to amaze. People can book it. They can go on national lakes and try and get on. But one thing I wanted to mention before is there's another lake that's definitely no fish in. I might have seen a fish or two from a certain Mr. Blair caught from there, but that's round the side, mate, that looks even more special. Like, that looks like a bit of Kevin Nash paradise that you've carved out. Oh, oh, just before I mention that, I will say that uh, anyone listening to this who's got a fishery with issues or you know, wants wants to you know, bounce off someone uh, or you know, the thinking of creating a fishery, you can always get in touch with me. You know, I'll happily pass on you know, my experiences and you know, what I've learned. Mm. You know, that's the only way we can really keep um, you know, carp fisheries going forward and developing if you know we all you know help each other but i'll happily do that um uh yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah, it's a new lake isn't it <laughs> <laughs> um it's it unfortunately won't be open to the public too right Kev. because it's basically it is my back garden it's, it's going to be 50 foot away from my new house and i'm sorry i don't want to ask carp anglers Sitting fifty foot away from my <laughs> breakfast table, um, yeah, yeah, it'd just be, it just be a place for me to watch them. Yeah, to yeah. enjoy what you enjoy about carp fishing, isn't it? Yeah, Which yeah. is the observations. Learn, so. learning, uh, yes, it will be occasionally fished because you know, like I said, you know, unless you see them on the bank, you really can't understand how they are doing. You know, and they can watch them in the water, but yeah, it'd be it'd be rarely fished. Once again, it won't be me that fishes it because I have no desire to. But mm. let's put it this way: if um, if you offer me ten grand cash, I mean, you might get an opportunity in the future. <laughs> it's a bit steep for me, Kev. <laughs> we'll work a few more years and see if we can chip away. Money, at Kev and money, get on. money won't buy it. It'll be, it'll be friendship. <laughs> That's the only way people are going to get on there. Mate, you're a star. I've thoroughly enjoyed this, Dale. Thank you for being so pleasure, honest, mate. Frank, as you always are in the podcast, mate. And um, it's a great insight into, yeah, that that side of your legacy, which um, I'm very fortunate to come in here and walk around and see people catch fish um, from time to time on there, mate. It's a beautiful thing you've created. So fair play to you, mate. Total Is that respect. Is that in there? Did, that, I put, did I put enough Fs in it to get banned? No, nice. you, there is probably parts I might have to take out because right. I don't want you to be carted away by police okay. in England. But that's quite mild for a Kevin Nash podcast, mate. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> You've done really well. Thank you so much. Before I go, you may see some strategically placed Lucy's Bowl pop-ups on here. I've been given these Good. by Mr. Bays, um, Keith uh, and Rich at big, Nash. Big shout to... Big oh, shout out. Gary Keith. Keith, I haven't spoken to you for ages, mate. About time you gave me a ring. And Rich, yeah, great work you're doing, lad. Top boy. Um, you will see on carpsocials.com or if you go on the Lucy's Bowl Facebook page, Lucy's Bowl's obviously collecting money and raising money for um, Guide Dogs Charity and Lucy's Bowl. Um, there are some pop-ups that are available to buy. All the money goes back into the charity. So please head to the Facebook page or to that carpsocials.com page and you'll be able to see um, those up for sale and get yourself some. If Sykes has been involved, they're probably quite 
fish catches. More effective, mate. Um, but as I said, thank you very much, Kev. Thank you for watching and listening. Please feel free to leave us a comment and subscribe. I'll see you again with another Nash Off The Hook podcast, and I'll let you get back to uh, a flight to Portugal, mate. Thank Thanks, you for mate. coming in. Thanks, Thanks for listening, everybody.